Decolonization is the meeting of two forces, opposed to each other by their very nature. Their first encounter was marked by violence, and their existence together, that is to say the exploitation of the native by the settler, was carried on by the impact of a great array of bayonets and cannons. In decolonization, there is therefore the need of a complete calling into question of the colonial situation. If we wish to describe it precisely, we might find it in the well-known words, the last shall be first and the first last. Decolonization is the putting into practice of this sentence. That is why, at a descriptive level, all decolonization is successful. The naked truth of decolonization evokes for us the searing bullets and blood-stained knives which emanate from it. For if the last shall be first, this will only come to pass after a murderous and decisive struggle between the two protagonists. That affirmed intention to place the last at the head of things can only triumph if we use all means to turn the scale, including, of course, that of violence. What's up, comrades, and buenvenidos, compañeros, to this week's episode of Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. I cannot even tell you how big Vlad, how much big dialectical energy I have to bring this episode to you this week. We have a very special new comrade guest and patron on the show, Comrade Brandt, who is one of the amazing editors at the new publication called Houston Review of Books, which already has been collaborating with yours truly, Chairman Bain. I have to go mobile. Over the last number of months, I've written a few book reviews for Houston Review of Books on J. Mufawad Paul's book, Demarcation and Demystification, and also on Kohei Saito's Karl Marx's Eco-Socialism. If you haven't checked those out already, I'm going to put a few links in the show notes, or you can just Google Houston Review of Books and you should find those no problem. Check out all the other amazing content they are working on over there as well, as if you like what we do, you're going to fucking love what they have going on. Comrade Brandt is on to discuss a work that I have been wanting to read for years now called Decolonizing Dialectics by George Chicarello Marr. As we discuss the book that Brandt is going to lead us through, we're going to talk about Georges Sorel, Franz Fanon, Enrique Dussel, decolonization, dialectics, obviously those are in the name. We're going to try to flesh out what those specifically mean. And this one is simultaneously part of the Revolutionary Politics in Central and South America series, and it also could fit into our Real Late Night Philosophy Hour series as well. So this one does a little bit of everything. I have to tell you, this is one of my favorite episodes we have ever done. Big shout out, big heart energy to Comrade Brand for coming on and leading us through and suggesting this amazing book, which I feel like is right in line with our work that we've been doing lately and the developments in dialectical pessimist thought that we've been working out in all the different places that that has been going down. Without further ado, we're going to get right into it. Let's quickly run over the logistics of how you can support Red Library if you enjoy the work that we're doing here week in and week out. Remember, if you'd like to become a patron for as little as $1 a month, that is less than a quarter an episode, you can get access to all of our exclusive content, patron exclusive episodes, at least one a month. Access to our Discord server, where you can get in on book groups, movie nights, ship posting, meme sharing, intense philosophical discussion, historical analysis, all that stuff. We're building a really, really amazing, very wholesome little community there, and we'd love to see you come join. You can find us at Patreon by simply typing in www.patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, dot com slash red library podcast if you're listening on itunes please remember to go down give us one of those star reviews maybe write us a line feel free to shit talk us that's totally fine we can take it as that is helping more and more potential comrades find the show follow us on twitter like the show on facebook remember that red library is part of the lost horizons podcasting network a collection of shows focused on developing the dialectical pessimist perspective that includes us our pod reds over at the regrettable century and from 78 remember we have a monthly roundtable discussion with a varying cast of characters from all the shows talking about all sorts of things related to politics, philosophy, psychoanalysis, and all that other good stuff. You can find a link for that in the show notes or just search on your favorite podcasting app. Well, here we are still, after all. And hey, just keep sharing the show around. Spread the love. Spread the decolonized dialectic. 
by revolutionary violence if necessary. I mean, no, come on. I mean, well, listen to the episode. You'll understand that isn't maybe as intense as it sounds. All right, y'all, let's do this damn thing. Me and our most excellent, eminent comrade Brandt on George Chicarella Mars decolonizing dialectics. We'll see you back here afterward. Yo, 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 comrades. Welcome to the library. We're in the theory section of the library today. We're, we're about to do some theoretical heavy lifting. We're about to put the decolonial razor's edge on all sorts of vulgar materialism and all sorts of other reactionary Marxist bullshit. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I just wanted to string together a bunch of words. <laughs> It sounds great. This is starting really well. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, I always like to start with just complete nonsense and absurdity. It feels like that's my vibe. But you can hear, I'm actually here with a very special new comrade, a comrade patron. I mean, someone who actually we have um, been doing all sorts of projects together now and, and collaborating in different ways. And I imagine we're going to do a lot more of the same in the future. So why don't you tell the comrades across the globe, who you are and what you do. Well, with comradely greetings to everyone, uh, this is uh, Brandt, uh, Comrade Brandt. Um, I'm an editor with the Houston Review of Books, and we've had a chance to publish some some wonderful book reviews from Adam, and uh, uh, he's given us a chance to today to discuss a really interesting book, and we'll get into that in a minute. Y'all can follow me on Twitter. It's a microblogging site that's totally ridiculous, at War of Maneuver, and uh, yeah, that's who I am. That's that's where I'm at at the moment. Um, just to, I'm in Houston, Texas. Yeah. So, and just to let everyone know, how long have y'all been around with Houston Review of Books now? And what sorts of things are you putting out? What's kind of like the, the project? We've been around for like three months. And the project has been centered around focusing on kind of like doing a refocus on the left and the south more generally, because, I mean, out of discussions I was having with some co-editors at one point, there was this issue that came up with, and this is an issue that came up with when I was in a different group back in the day, like five, six years ago called Threshold, which was like a unity and struggle front group thing. I wasn't a member but <laughs> of a unity and struggle, but I was a member of the front group. Uh, anyway, so a uh, question that we got into was the question of like, after the civil rights struggle in the South, the left pretty much leaves. And a lot of folks who end up on the left or become Marxist or of different flavors end up going to LA, Chicago, New York, Seattle, elsewhere. They leave, which is normal. Like uh, mm -hmm. Comrade Adam and I were discussing, we left our hometowns and we came to much bigger cities, even yep. though we ended up in cities in the South this time. But yeah, um, it's a natural process. And it was something that we were discussing was, okay, so we left open this gigantic political void in which we don't have a whole lot to work with. So we end up questioning exactly what needed to be done and which is something all comrades, all good comrades do, I suppose. And mm -hmm. we decided that we would try to build a political cultural project in Houston where we could get together different organizers and different organizations to sit at the same table and talk and, and do work together and possibly build a cultural uh, front as well. And because and, we need culture, you know, like our yeah. protests can't just be kind of quasi military chants where it's like, hey, hey, ho, ho, this whatever X has got to go. But, you know, like having a little bit more to it, you know, like in Houston, we've been lucky to have some bands show up for protest and like so like people are really vibing people are really feeling it and it becomes more lively so like trying, trying to create like a new culture around uh, politics on the left in Houston is something that we've been about and we just started up and we're really happy with the momentum. That's awesome. And I mean, I think it's it's interesting to think about the gap left by the civil rights movement in the South and how, you know, in some ways, like what you're describing is kind of putting, you know, since you were talking about war of maneuver and, and war position, putting that Gramscian sort of political perspective into action and trying to build some real working class proletarian culture because we sorely need it. So, and, you know, no other place than the true fucking belly of the beast of the global imperialist war machine, which is is, you know, Texas and the oil industry and the hyper rampant capitalism that just lays waste to everything in this state. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, being in Houston and just like, I mean, I used to live in Baytown, Texas, which is like the east side of Houston. And like, I used to live next to the second largest Exxon plant in the country. Um, and it's this yeah. smell some days you couldn't go outside. Like it was just, I lived like a mile away. It was just too much. We have a lot of changes to be made here. Kind of like you were saying, you know, I've written a couple of book reviews for, for y'all and I've been reading your reviews and the essays that you've been publishing and y'all are putting out really, really great stuff. And so I'll make sure we link a bunch of stuff in the show notes. And so people go down, check that out, comrades, show them some love, go read some shit, maybe submit some stuff. If you want to wax poetic, like I like to do and all sorts of dumb guy, weird theory shit. So, I mean, hopefully, you know, 
it comes off across as more than dumb guy theory shit. But anyway, check out what they're doing. It's really amazing stuff. So, all right. Well, I have to tell you, you know, we were talking right before you hit record that this book was your suggestion after we kind of talked about, oh, like you should come on the show and do something. And uh, as I was telling you, the book that you picked has been on my reading list for quite some time. Just had not around to it yet. But now that I've read it, and you're going to leave this episode, but I I wanted to read it just for the hell of it. This is legit one of my favorite books I've read in recent memory. And I am like big glad that we're going to be covering this on the show. So do you want to tell everyone what you picked and and why you picked this book of all books? Of all the books I picked, I picked uh, Decolonizing Dialectics by George Chicarello Mar. George Chicarello Mare? I wasn't sure how to pronounce his last name. And I I hope he's not hearing this and is offended, but... (laughs) What do you think it is, Mar or Mayor? Yeah, I've heard it's Chicarello Mar. Okay, Chicarello Mar. All right, good. So another thing that I, I tend to do is about a week ago, I was finally corrected after many years of pronouncing dialectic as dialectic. I've been saying dialectic for years instead of mm-hmm. dialectic, so I put the C in the wrong place in, in, the, in the words. So if I say dialectic, I mean dialectic. So just be <laughs> forewarning to our listeners. I'll, I'll run it through a filter. So every time you say dialectic, it'll just autocorrect it with like a weird AI voice <laughs> to say dialectic. So we got you covered, comrade. No, no worries. Also, just before we dive in, we were kind of mentioning this, and I know it, people can't see it, but you and I are both ginger comrade brothers and so this is an episode brought to you by the red army faction <laughs> so, better red than dead that's yeah. right, exactly <laughs> so i had to make sure we shoehorn that in here because anytime i run into another comrade who's a ginger it's just immediately like hey we're the red army faction now and then i always gauge how that's uncomfortable right. that makes them so <laughs> all right no, i mean i bought into it i was like yeah let's fuck shit up let's burn shit um <laughs> but not, not really right now for the for my handler who's listening my cia handler well yeah um, and mine and mine too we don't want to like we don't want to fuck up our paycheck you know <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So I'm curious. I mean, you know, we've been having a lot of discussions in the discord lately around Marxism and class critique and class analysis as it relates to things about like decolonization, um, indigenous movements, Afro pessimism. You know, so to me, this episode is coming at a perfect time that kind of is really in line with the active ongoing debates, you know, like very loving, critical and comradely debates. But I think we're all trying to like work through like, what is this relationship to a Marxist project? anti-imperialism, decolonization. So to me, I, it's like absolutely the most perfect book you could have picked because it, reading through it, I think it's going to actually really help clarify, especially for people who come from a more Marxist background who talk about dialectics, you know, and even me, I kind of joke around, like sometimes I use that word and it's like, it's just a joke. It's like anything I don't understand, I'm just going to say it's dialectical. I think it's a really, <laughs> it's a really fascinating project that Chicarella Mar is doing. And I think his sources and what he draws on, like I would say this book has already changed my thinking in a lot of ways. So I'm curious for you, though, like, what was it about this book? Or yeah, what drew you to wanting to cover this on the show? I mean, it was really the past three months of uh, the political sequences we've seen, uh, especially from really, I, I, we could say from May onward, but I mean, we could say even earlier, but especially it felt like it from May to, I mean, our present moment. I mean, uh, we're recording this. It's like, can we say when we recorded this? Is that okay? Like, yeah, what yeah. day? I mean, time is a flat circle. Okay. I really don't care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, we're going to get into uh, the theological and anti-theological stuff in a exactly. later, but uh, <laughs> I guess it doesn't matter when we're saying this. So it's August 10th, and we just had the rebellions in Chicago, and I'm thinking about exactly how and why people rebel the way they do, of course, which is something that's always in the back of our minds. Mm-hmm. And to me, this book is uh, kind of represents what it looks like when contradictions finally rupture and what, what how that plays out politically. And I'm just, I, I can't get over the image. I don't know if you saw this, but there was this uh, picture on Twitter that was trending. Um, I think it was like from some weather uh, person in Chicago um, was saying that that they were lifting the, it shows like the bridges being lifted. Mm-hmm. Now, apparently there are bridges that connect like, I did, I've never been to Chicago, so I don't know what Chicago looks like, but apparently there's bridges that connect to downtown from the rest of Chicago and they closed up the bridges, you know, it's kind of like a moat mm-hmm. that gets the out, you know, that's that sort of thing, the, yeah. the wretched of the earth you know, trying to like tear down the walls. This felt like a very timely book, even as of the past 24 hours. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because in this particular political moment, I think its relevance is pretty profound. And also, you know, to me, one of the things that we always try to do on Red Library, I think the spirit of what we do on the show, and what we've always done is we always want to pick books that seem relevant for today's left and really bring a perspective or, or kind of expand our, you know, our horizons, theoretical, practical, 
horizons for organizing and thinking and sort of, you know, being in solidarity and even like questioning like, okay, what does it mean to be in solidarity in a way that I think is really productive. And so for me, this is, again, you know, it's one of those books that I've wanted to read this for years. I haven't read it and reading it now, it's like, fuck, this should be on like everyone's like, you're a baby leftist. Here's one of the books that you should read as like your entry point into politics in today's world. And so to me, I think this is a perfect book because it's like a book that you maybe won't really get to it anytime soon or maybe you know it's got published what three years ago now so maybe it's kind of like you know things get published so fast so many books out there it's kind of almost you may not run across this but it's relevance especially if you call yourself a marxist or an anarchist anyone who's part of like the quote-unquote like western left it just feels to me like oh yeah this is just a primary source that we should all have now oh i completely agree and the thing is it's like hiding with duke university press like it's hiding in this academic publishing house I, you know, I was a little surprised by that because, like, I was like, oh, this is a book from Duke. He, well, I mean, you know, you know, Duke publishes stuff from, like, Frederick Jameson and shit. So, you know, I was kind yeah. of like, okay, I, I know I'm going to be in for some, like, theoretical heavy lifting. And I was, like, shocked at the radical implications of the book and the analysis. It's like the fact that this was published through, like, a mainstream academic press, I think, is really astonishing. It is. And what's more astonishing to me is also this was his, his dissertation, apparently, at, like, Cal Berkeley for political science or political theory. And it's, he just like kind of grabbed like a few thinkers and kind of smashed them together, but he did it in a way that made a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And given like his reputation uh, as a writer and as a Twitter person, I don't know what to call a Twitter person, a Twitterer? A, a, <laughs> a, a I don't twi- know what they're called. Twitterite? A Twitterite. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Let's yeah. go with that. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a bit different. He's not your regular academic. So I'll, I'll give him that. And in different in the most positive way when I say that. Yeah, I, I would, that is definitely a, a statement of high, high praise that he is not your typical academic. <laughs> so for anyone that doesn't know, I was curious, do you do you remember whenever he got he well, I guess he basically lost his his teaching position and got banned from Twitter because of saying spicy shit that just pissed off everybody. Do you remember much about when that happened? Because it was what, like a couple of years ago now? Yeah, I think I remember being on Twitter that night too. Cause at the time I was like too addicted to Twitter and <laughs> I had a Twitter account back then where I had like a thousand followers, which so now the one I have now is smaller, thank God. Um, <laughs> the Twitter left is, is a place and I'll just say that. So I, I saw it <laughs> and he tweeted and it was about white genocide. And I was like, oh, this looks great. I think it was the hashtag was all I want for Christmas. And he, I think he, he put white genocide as like the last. Yeah bit of it so and of course that pissed off people who it, we expected it to piss off and it pissed off you know the far right and, mm-hmm. this, and these kind of like what do you I, the the alt right as they call themselves some of them but yeah it's the fascists all of them yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And listen, I mean, it's a, you know, we're very much about complex and nuanced analysis here, but whenever it comes to the alt-right, it, I'm fine with painting with a very broad brush. So that's totally yeah, fine. That's fine. <laughs> it's all the same. They, they don't require too much deep analysis, I don't think, sometimes. Yeah. Do you know much about where Chikorel Amar is now or where he's ended up? Because I, I can't remember what, was it Vanderbilt that he was teaching at at the time or something like that? It's a Vanderbilt-like school. He was at, people are forgetting the name of this. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's probably uh, on the book. <laughs> university. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Fuck. Yeah, we're close uh, readers here in yeah. our library. Yeah. It's, well, we close read it's, it's everything except for the back of the book. Yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a very undeserved place. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, Charles Mills has something here. Frederick Jameson wrote something very nice about the book. So, yeah, like it's a, the back cover of the book is nice. We should mm-hmm. go there more often. Yeah, we should. Um, I will say, like, too, just to, for anyone that isn't familiar with Chickarella Mar, the thing that I think is really fascinating about him and the thing I'm most interested in, you know, and just so you know, I was kind of thinking about this. This episode should maybe be part of our Revolutionary Politics in Central and South America series because of how much we're going to talk about Hugo Chavez and Venezuela. His other books he's written are actually on Chavez. And I think one is called, what, Building the Commune that was published by Verso yeah. and like one of their smaller book series. So I feel like that's also kind of his political focus as well. And and I think that really does show up in his analysis. Like you see him drawing on that tradition and like the, the political movements there. And in a, in a, I think it just absolutely incredibly theoretically productive way. Yeah, I think so too. I think this whole book is very productive uh, theoretically. I think it gives us a few tools to think through and work with and it's certainly great for the baby marxists um but of <laughs> and course all my and like baby very, very older too. yes baby anarchists too yeah actually baby anarchists would really like the the I, conclusion of this especially like i was thinking that yeah so my older like comrades who are like gen xers and a little bit older than that uh who are very like kind of ml they were telling me how much they didn't like the book and <laughs> least shocking <laughs> and, like, thing i've ever heard in my life <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Who would have guessed it? Like, <laughs> especially because like Chikorel Mar is more like leftcom, yeah. You know, and, mm-hmm. and so a little bit about him, I guess too, is that like he was a part of Bring the Ruckus in Oakland, which mm-hmm. is uh, 
I don't know how much comrade listeners listen know about this, but they brought the ruckus. I mean, to put it shortly, um, in Oakland for a long time. <laughs> and they had this cadre training manual that was called How to Think, mm-hmm. which is like the most like Lenin written title I think I've ever heard. And it's his whole understanding of like dialectics seems to come out of that. And that was originally written by a group called the STO, the Sojourner Truth Organization. Yeah, we had talked about this a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that maybe we can say is this is definitely like if you're, yeah, more like Boomer or like Gen X ML, this is definitely like the millennial and the Zoomer decolonized leftcom shit. We're coming for you on this episode, just so you know. The daggers are out. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I have a lot of like kind of bigger theoretical questions here uh, that we can go through. And then there's like, but we could also go chapter by chapter because this is a very meaty book for a it book is. that's like 200 pages, maybe a little less than that. Like, I, yeah, I was, less than 200 pages. I, I was shocked. I mean, again, it's it actually kind of reminds me of uh, Alenka Zupancic's What is Sites That We Read. You know, you see the book and it's like, oh, this is short. Should be a pretty easy read. And then you realize it's just like so dense. You really have to read closely and do a lot of theoretical work, which I think is actually amazing that – you know, for 200 pages, the amount of depth in the analysis to me, it's one of the reasons why I said this is like one of the best books I've read in a long time, because it, it really pushed my own thinking, you know, and I did not expect the sh- the length of the book and, you know, just sort of the approach of it. I didn't expect it to be as sort of rigorous as it was. But again, you know, if it was this thesis, I didn't realize that it would make sense why it's it's very sharp and it's just very structured and very methodical in that way. Yeah, it is. And I mean, I would have never thought to go to George Sorrell for any questions of dialectics or much less anything else at the time, actually. But yeah, that he starts off with him is incredible to me and actually makes some really interesting arguments about Sorrell we can get into. Um, I mean, in a way, I have to tell you, we might be trying to recuperate for today's left a figure that has been taboo for a very, very long time. Yeah, I never would have in my life imagined. Yeah, Reflections on Violence actually has a lot of like good shit in it. But yeah, like, <laughs> like this he writes it when he's like, you know, still very much a strong Marxist. And like, I mean, so like the big hot take for George, for Chikorella Mar is that GCM, I'm gonna call him GCM. The rest Let's of the do episode, GCM. Probably. I think that sounds good. Yeah. I think he would be fine with it. So what George says now <laughs> is that uh, Sorrell is not so much of a fascist and he's really that fascism as, as an ideology was drawn out of him in any way is actually like theoretically more of like a misunderstanding on their part. I think they mm-hmm. like misread Sorrell is what it sounds like, but they latched on to the, the kind of energy in that book where mm-hmm. it's just like, you know, taking like, cause I mean, I, I remember reading Antonio Gramsci a, a few years ago and he mentioned, he, he uses Sorrell a lot. And there's a lot of people who are very Sorrell influenced mm-hmm. and because Sorrell so taboo for so long that it's strange to like tell people yeah like Gramsci is like kind of a Sorelian and Jose Carlos uh, Maria Tegui is is kind of a Sorelian um actually super Sorelian yeah like yeah. I've read Maria Tegui I didn't feel like I was reading a Marxist I felt like I was reading a Sorelian like yeah. that whole thing is very passionate and written in that prose and it's also very like theoretically based in that um and Maria Tegui comes up later in this book but the GCM also makes the claim that Sorel also influenced one of all two Sarah's ideas and we can get into that as well. And like some of Foucault, which mm-hmm. I would not have expected to put those two together. And then, of course, Fanon. He, he actually uses good evidence to, to make the case that Sorel was very influ- influential on Fanon. Yeah, and I think yeah. that is actually already a, a beautiful little preview of just all the just icy cold shit that is in this book. So, okay, because the density of the book and everything else, you're leading this episode. So whenever okay. you lead an episode on RL, it's kind of up to you to decide how you want to take us through the material. So what way feels best for you to communicate the ideas of, of GCM in the book and sort of the analysis? The best way would be to, uh, I have like little things written for each chapter and we can go, kind of go like chapter by chapter for some of these little things. And then I have like much bigger questions that would help like formulate uh, this question of whether or not uh, this is dialectical or whether or not this is dialectics and whether or not like anyway I think it is but that's that's my big hot take on this but so <laughs> like okay. the book is right but yeah so I actually kind of wanted to ask you just as a opening salvo let's say um, that we're just gonna fire a shot across the deck and just uh, really just go hard right at it so Boom. what do you think decolonizing dialectics means for GCM it means taking two different bodies of work, which is something like 
dialectics, which is thrown into, and there's different understandings of dialectics, you know, whether it's broadly Hegelian, broadly Marxist in, that, in those traditions, and then decolonial theory, between the two, there's this great tension. Mm -hmm. But there's also great, it's like something like queer studies, which is actually very like useful for thinking through certain political questions. But of course, it's been like mired in liberalism for years. This question around decolonial theory and post-colonial theory especially has been mired in the same political backwardness, I would say, about liberalism. But there's something useful in both. And like he takes decolonial theory and takes what's useful from it and brings it against the edge of dialectics and allows, builds a new tool out of that. And I think that new tool is, if I'm going to call it anything, I mean, he defines uh, dialectics as the, as the dynamic movement of conflictive oppositions. And of course, that goes against all my uh, my older comrades' understandings of dialectics and like Althusser and like Adorno and yeah. um, negative dialectics, that tradition. Um, in the whole Frankfurt School tradition, I guess it goes against that. My fellow RAF cadre member. So since you brought that up, I mean, obviously we have these two huge huge signifiers that are really important and are typically seen as being in opposition to each other. So decolonial or post-colonial theory and dialectics, which is, you know, usually historically has been the property of, of Marxist thought, right? Whenever you think about, let's say, our, our older boomer Gen X <laughs> comrades, how do you think they would contrast what dialectics is coming from, you know, maybe this Frankfurt School tradition? So, so what's the kind of like friction there? What's the alternative understanding? The alternative understanding from what I've gotten from them and from and just from reading other things was that you know, Marxism is an anti-Hegelianism. Marxism is with dialectical materialism is like it's the opposite. Dialectical materialism is uh, meant to understand more internationalist questions rather than questions of identity. They would never want to use dialectics to understand identity. They would rather use like different terms completely because they feel like if you stretch the, the definition of dialectics too far, it breaks mm -hmm. and that it doesn't become as useful. And for me, that I, I guess that's where they stand from what I've heard. And so GCM is gonna be like, nah, we're gonna we're gonna do that anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, fuck it. Yeah, just mask off time. <laughs> right, fucking fire emojis all day, like <laughs> yeah, all throughout this book. Yeah. So yeah, okay, but just throw them in there. It'd be great. Yeah, actually, that would be great. Go like, ahead. at some point, we're going to have a theory book like this with just emojis just peppered throughout the text. I can't <laughs> wait for that day. And Duke Press is going to publish it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's going to be great. <laughs> okay, so um, I think that that's, like, really important. So let's start with maybe just thinking about, yeah, like, what does dialectics mean for GCM? Maybe what's uh, the typical alternative understanding that he's going to push back on? And, and that was kind of also why I wanted to think about, like, what does decolonial mean for him? Because my encounters and sort of understanding and, and study of decolonial and postcolonial theory is always very much context dependent in a lot of ways. It's like, whenever you think about what does it mean to decolonize, you have to really look at the very key specific context in which you're going to talk about what that would mean. So decolonizing in you know Brazil looks different than you know, Venezuela or like India. And so I think it's helpful to think about what exactly does that word mean? Because, you know, for a lot of more quote unquote, like the vulgar Marxists that I, I know and that I love very much, I feel like the second you throw out the word decolonial, there's this like bucking against that term because they equate it with some like sort of like anti-Marxist, uh, like quote unquote, idealist, liberal sort of worldview about things. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I, I agree with you. <laughs> I don't have anything to add to that. I think it's just, it's yeah. helpful to think about, to me, the radicality of what he's doing by trying to put these two things together, I think. And, and you know, and it's one of the things I love very much about, like, someone like Mari Rudy in the field of Lacanian psychoanalysis actually, I think, does something similar. It's why I love her work, because she basically says there's Lacanian psychoanalysis here. It's opposite. It's, it's sort of interlocutor tends to be affect theorists. And they're kind of thought to be these two you know, mutually exclusive camps. And she says, well, no, like, fuck that. Like, I'm going to put them together. And I think it creates this amazing, beautiful, generative framework to understand political phenomena and psychological phenomena. So I think that's kind of why I really took to this book, because I'm like, it felt, it was like, oh, this feels like what Mari Rudy does. And I just love the idea that, oh, yeah, like, there isn't anything sacred about putting these together. Let's see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a big part of political theory. I mean, obviously, this is a dissertation, so a lot of this is comparative political theory. But I think that that method method of or at least that logic of taking two two theories and like seeing where they can meet and and where where the tension lies and exactly what can be built from that especially if it's something as creative as decolonizing dialectics yeah. is something that it's always, always a worthwhile project yeah colonialism is not a thinking machine nor a body endowed with reasoning faculties it is violence 
in its natural state, and it will only yield when confronted with greater violence. Well, comrade, why don't you uh, take us in? Engage. Okay. I wanted to start a bit with this first chapter on Georges Sorel. Sorel, of course, I mean, throughout this chapter that, that we read, he's very critical of the first thing is Jacobinism, and Jacobinism means something very particular for Sorel. And Sorel is writing uh, a lot of his political work at the turn of the 20th century in France. So this is pre-World War I, the contradictions of post-Paris Commune and, and much of what, what occurs uh, later, of course, in France is like building up at this period. And Jacobinism for him means that you have these like kind of out-of-touch political leaders who don't understand the masses and don't have, at least as far as he's critiquing the socialist in, in France and the socialist party in France, and he's critiquing the fact that they are not exactly uh, ready to lead the people and that they're going to give in too much to certain things and they've abided themselves too much to capitalism. So his response is something uh, more along the lines of like closer to anarchism. Like he's very critical of, of electoral democracy and he's he's even critical of like labor arbitration. Mm -hmm. uh, he thinks that's like the union is the highest form of organization for him. And for that reason, he also sees something like dialectics as something very limited because his understanding of dialectics is that two folds into one. And then therefore you get, he just thinks it's bullshit. He thinks it just leads to a kind of like nice stasis where nothing happens. He thinks that dialectics is harmonious, has a harmonious closure. And he has this uh, quote about dialectics here in the first chapter. What page you on? It is on literally, uh, it's 23. So he says uh, at the beginning of that first chapter, at least what George Sorrell says is, he says dialectics is, quote, the art of reconciling opposites by means of nonsense, unquote. And I thought that was a great understanding of dialectics for the kind of dialectics that he gets thrown um, during that period uh, when French socialism is starting to like, kind of like creep around the corner and build up in unions, among other things. And mm -hmm. He's not exactly excited about it. It is interesting that like GCM is taking, obviously Sorel, but he's also taking Foucault and we're going to discuss Enrique Dussel later, people who are very critical of dialectics and certainly even Fanana for his own reasons, although yeah. he has his own like useful uh, response to dialects, at least the Hegelian dialectic as he understood it. So mm -hmm. um, this is a very unorthodox book as we've been discussing. Yeah. And moving on from, from chapter one, I'm going to do some very like quick overviews and then we're going to get into like bigger questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. So in chapter one, he obviously spends time uh, discussing um, uh, kind of a socialism through barbarism sort of thing rather than like socialism or barbarism, which is like kind of Sorel's understanding of dialectics, which is like, very much a part of this like you can only get there through violence and only through the like, way means by violence is also like the kind of like political acts of the people in which they rise up and fight back which as we've seen in the past 24 hours can happen in a place like chicago it can happen in st louis uh not far from where you're from and other places yeah yeah and my understanding but, of the historical context for sorel is that dialectics kind of like you were saying was really this like a sort of ideological obfuscation of the fact that class antagonism had become this static thing and so my understanding of like what he saw the role of violence to be was to sort of restart the engine of history, to sort of redraw the lines and say, no, there is class antagonism here. And so dialectics for him is sort of um, reshaped into an, a tool to actually draw those divisions and restart the engine of class conflict, which, you know, at the time, especially in Western Europe at this time, like had ground down to a halt. And it was, oh, yes, we can just, you know, through electoral politics, socialism is naturally on the rise, and it will eventually, uh, we can transition into, uh, into socialism in a much more sort of harmonious way. And so for me, you know, again, thinking back to that idea of Sorel being taboo, was always like, oh, shocked that the fascist would fucking misread someone who was like a nuanced, like left wing philosopher. You know, and, and I think most people forget a lot of the initial fascist sorts of figures and movements did come out of a sort of disenchantment with socialist promises that capitalism would be brought to an end. I think that's a really important history that we forget all too often. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Mussolini is case in point. I mean, there was a guy who was a member of a socialist party yeah. who Gramsci even defended at one point when mm -hmm. he was a member of the socialist party and then yeah. later gets imprisoned by him, which is irony of history. Uh, something you, you hit on, which is very important for this, I mean, for this whole book is that like the fact that dialectics is being proposed as a harmonious closure is also part of something that's called teleology, that kind of like teleological line of history. Whereas Sorel is very against that. And so what ends up coming out and something that I've never seen anyone like use the word spirals to describe history, mm -hmm. but and I really, it's going to be very hard to describe with words, but like essentially George doesn't imagine a straight line, rather he imagines something like, um, like literally like something like a spiral from like one 
a political sequence uh, to contradictions into another political sequence of contradictions kind of whirls its way up like a little tornado. I, I don't know, like a, I'm trying to think of like a slinky. It's like a slinky. You know how a slinky is built for our <laughs> listeners. Everyone knows it's slinky. It's slinky. It's slinky. It's, it's, it goes in a circle. It's literally a spiral. That's, yeah. that's how he imagines time rather than as a straight line in which we go from feudalism to capitalism to mm -hmm. socialism to communism. It's something he's very critical of. Well, and I think one of the most important things about engaging with the decolonial postcolonial perspective is to reshape or to sort of like critique and undermine the sort of linear conception of teleological time that most people who are from anything in like a Judeo-Christian, like Western sort of background, the assumptions that we operate on are like metaphysical assumptions about time and space. And to me, I think one of the most interesting and radical things to do is to think about decolonization for us means that you have to rethink what time is in the first place. And I know that it's like, you know, like big galactic brain philosophical <laughs> shit. But, but I think like in a lot of ways, it's like, that's part of, to me, that's part of what it is to be on the left today, is to take that seriously and think about how would it reshape our political understanding of the world and what it is to be, to call for revolution or like a, you know, utopian horizon if our idea of time is still built on this linear model. That's right. And uh, you made me think of a, a quote from Marx. Uh, luckily, I actually had this bookmarked uh, from the Grundrisse where he says, quote, the economy of time to, the, to this, all economy ultimately reduces itself, unquote. So for us, like time is actually something we do have to, yeah, I guess decolonize. And, and if we decolonize it, that gives us a chance to like think through rather than that kind of teleology that we're deal dealt with that very straight line of history we get a chance to really think through exactly how the kind of spirals of time affect economy and our understanding of economy and, and the economic mode of production so yeah it, like challenging teleology is a central part of this book um even though it's doesn't have a whole chapter devoted to it or anything but uh it's it's everywhere in this and certainly with like jose carlos maria tigui who is very critical of in his books seven interpretive essays on peruvian reality i think i got the whole name correct yeah, where he critique where he critiques the common turn line about how capitalism has to be developed in peru before they can fight for socialism so they must develop capitalism and fight for uh the stages of uh, forces of production to get stronger when that's impossible under a neo-colonial relationship that peru has as to, I guess, British capital at the time and certainly later American capital. Mm -hmm. So challenging that teleology is very important for uh, getting out of the colonial and neocolonial situation. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, beautifully said. Yeah. And the fact that we get to talk about Bariatigui, like, like specifically, we've mentioned him in past episodes with like Noah de Lissavoy because, you know, Noah, d his whole project is like Fanon and Freire and like thinking about Marxism engaging with the decolonial perspective. So, you know, to me, it's it's really amazing. I think we're going to talk about some of these figures specifically because they've, they've been there in the background the whole time, I think. Absolutely. And it really enriches this book a lot, the fact that he's able to, like, include uh, different people in here. He's also including, like, big figures like Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, who he decides to rip on instead, <laughs> and for good reason. I think he has... He has yeah. I mean, it's kind of like me now. Like he wrote on Francis Fukuyama in the, in the introduction. It's like, ah, oh, it's kind of played out. Like, <laughs> like Fukuyama sucks. Like uh, he knows he sucks. <laughs> like, Fukuyama doesn't need to be reminded that he was wrong about history. Like, it's fun to do it. I think we should always do it. I suppose, but you know, like I hate to say this for like our autonomous friends, but like when was the last time Antonio Negri and Michael Hart were relevant politically? It's been twenty years, maybe. I, well, you know, this is precisely why whenever we did our, our top thirty leftist theorists episodes, we did Hart and Negri first, and they were in the D tier. I mean, there's a reason why they're in the D tier. <laughs> I love my autonomous comrades, but come on, it seems like their moment has passed and their analysis, whatever relevance it had at the time, feels like it has uh, lost its bite. It has. At least they have a Viewpoint magazine to read every once in a while, which is <laughs> nice, you know. Um, you, no, no, a, no, 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 I, I mean spice, that in the nicest way. Spice coming off of the mic. <laughs> As we lovingly say in our book groups that we, we do out of the Discord, do you mind if I bring it back to the text for a moment? Yeah, of course. So actually, I was just um, reading through some of my marks here. It's a little long, but I kind of wanted to read through these three essential moments in Sorel's recasting of the dialectic. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so this is on 28. He says, first, Sorel okay. diagnoses the frozen immobility of the present, becoming in the process one of the first substantial theorists of ideology and of what would later come to be known as hegemony. Second, confronted with a dialectical impasse, Sorel set about theorizing how the proletariat might, shoulder to the wheel of history, set historical oppositions into dynamic motion, deploying mythical violence to reestablish those oppositions whose sharp edges have been worn down by ideology. And then finally, in a third moment, 
Sorel embraced the profound open-endedness of this dialectic by rejecting the de determinism of his contemporary Marxists and foregrounding the unpredictable creativity of a radically transformative revolutionary violence, which I remember hitting that sense. I was just like, this fucking book is just hot fire. <laughs> so uh, to me, yeah, again, like my understanding of Sorel, all of that was just all of that nuance and the, the purpose of why he invoked violence in the way that he did in my ML organizing and all of my reading of fascism completely obliterated that as like actually what he was doing. Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, it's amazing how much we buried Sorel on the left. Like this right? is a guy who really does deserve a bit more credit. Yeah. He used to be called, I think, he mentions he was called the Socrates of the Latin Quarter. Like he's a, you know, he was a man of the people too. You know, he's walking yeah. around. I, I imagine he's also kind of like walking around, like you know, doing what Socrates did, in, in the most positive way, not annoying people the way Socrates might have. But <laughs> he wasn't he agitating. Was, he, yeah, he wasn't just like a socialist troll. Yeah, he wasn't that mean, which is nice. At the very but, least, though, it's like yeah, it's it's he's someone that we might want to go back. You know, we're all about reclaiming lost horizons, like and like recuperating history in new ways. This seems like a, a at least an interesting figure to rethink about. You know, to reengage with yeah i was gonna bring that up as well for y'all because i know that the uh that dialectical pessimism is so big with y'all um this is a guy who writes a lot about pessimism like that whole uh, reflections on violence that's the book mm -hmm. reflexion sur la violence in french is very ridden with pessimism yeah like pessimism like entrenched in the book and i I think it could be reclaimed partially for this project. It's something for y'all to think about as, as y'all think more about this question of dialectical pessimism and even where dialectical pessimism meets something like the decolonized dialectic. That is exactly what I am most interested in. And that's already what this book has influenced me in thinking through is like where those two things, I, th I think actually there's a really, really radical generative sort of meeting point for them. But, you know, again, that's, that's for more work down the road. That's right. Yeah, I mean, we can move on to uh, chapter two on... Uh, Franz Fanon, Black Skin, White Mask, Let's which is it. the next thing he hits on. Friend of the show, to, but... Franz Fanon. <laughs> national liberation, national renaissance, the restoration of nationhood to the people, whatever may be the headings used or the new formulas introduced, decolonization is always a violent phenomenon. Decolonization is a historical process. It cannot be understood it cannot become clear to itself except by the movements which give it historical form and content. Decolonization, which sets out to change the order of the world, is obviously a program of complete disorder. But it cannot come as a result of magical practices, nor of a natural shock, nor of a friendly understanding. The chapter is called Towards the New Dialectics of Race. And he immediately starts with, like, discuss Jean-Paul Sartre, which is not someone I would expect him to start with. But, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Sartre start kind of starts with, like, a, a kind of disavowal of uh, Fanon uh, regarding Sorel in the preface to The Wretched of the Earth. And I had to go back and look, read it because I was like, he mentioned Sorel. But apparently he did. He said something to the extent of that, quote, if you set aside Sorel's fascist utterances, you will find that Fanon is the first since Engels, Frederick Engels, I mean, that is, to return the midwife of history to the light. Unquote. Mm -hmm. uh, and then GCM continues saying, to understand violence, Sartre implies, is to understand Marx and Engels' famous phrase, the midwife of history, and of the many attempts to grasp, to grasp this assisted birth of the new, but three figures stand out, Engels, Sorel, and now Fanon, the praise could not be more explicit, unquote. Um, so, in a strange way, like, like Sartre was like, like super aware of the fact that like Fanon had like a had some influence from Sorel and I thought that was like so we're kind of like bringing more of this like kind of like lost history together yeah uh that wasn't so clear before it kind of like speaking of that lost history you know one of the things I think is most interesting is she talks about uh Hannah Rent, who in her book on violence you know she was really influential because the conception that she developed was violence is precisely what we utilize whenever power fails. And so this is just really quickly, this is GCM. He says, in On Violence, Arendt draws Sorel and Fanon together, not according to the underlying structure of their dialectics, but rather according to their shared emphasis on violence and their efforts, which are heretical for Arendt, to politicize this essentially anti-political concept. But Arendt's rigid definition of violence as quote unquote incapable of speech as mute and muting as mortal threat to power as collective action is wholly incompatible with what both Sorel and Fanon meant by the term. So I, I found that to be a really powerful thing because that conception of rent is I think very influential and the idea that it obscures yes. the underlying connection between Fanon and Sorel I thought was again just kind of blew my mind apart. No same um, it's it's kind of nice to see someone in academia actually take a shot at a rent that's very rare especially in an academic press so like 
gets I'm, a, I'm surprised it even got published like it's only something gets like ripped out yeah um <laughs> thinking back to my undergrad years when i had um, professors quote a rent to me was like very i remember it was a way to like depoliticize us uh particularly um at least in the context in which they were talking to us but yeah a rent was very much used as a weapon against uh student organizing for us <laughs> yeah well you know there's yeah. a reason why whenever a rent came up on our our leftist theorist episode we said you know she's real low grade tier because she's you know i again i've read a rent and i think she's useful in certain ways but she's she's like the classical liberal theorist that has dominance in the academy. Yeah, she is. It's kind of like crazy. Like she has such a like a fixation on Heidegger, um, also a sexual one, I think, a romantic one, if I remember correctly. But I, they were um, they were definitely hooking up for a while. Yeah. Yeah, that was always. <laughs> I guess she has a good understanding uh, of this question then in, in her own way. But apparently Heidegger fucked. I never would have thought about it, but apparently Heide- Heidegger did fuck. So. <laughs> It's kind of like a, you never want to. It's like one of those things you never want to imagine. Like for a young child to imagine their parent like having sex. It's like that. You don't want to imagine Heidegger fucking. It's it's not something we want on our minds. Yeah, it's like the primal yeah, scene sorry, for, for Freud. Comrade you know? listeners, there's nothing sacred on our fucking show. Yeah, I mean Heidegger banging is like the primal scene that just is like the instantiating trauma of your subjectivity for sure. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, keep us on track here. This is this is on you to keep us on track. I can do this all yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, it's on me. All right, look, let's keep our shit together. We're having fun. Okay. We're having a good time. Yeah, we are. This is something that's really big with decolonizing dialectics overall is that, okay, so we saw with Terrell that decolonization involves the kind of relations that are combative. And then with Fanon, we're seeing something where decolonizing dialectics, uh, see, I'm saying dialectics, not dialectics, um, stands against false universals. And false universals is something that's very big in this book. He quotes and like rips on, and rightfully so for the right reasons, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and his, there was this, I guess it was an anthology of poetry. I'm not sure exactly what this is, but it was called Black Orpheus, Mm -hmm. which is, or that was the name of the preface or introduction Sartre wrote, I'm not quite sure, but it was supposed to be a dedication to the art style and the, particularly like the, the style of poetry called negritude, mm-hmm. which is so big in uh, across uh, the colonized world, at least in, among like what was the French Empire at the time, especially in like Senegal, and then what is still part of France today, Martinique and Guadeloupe, and I suppose French Guiana maybe was big there too. But Sartre makes this claim in, in Black Orpheus that, you know, race is a particular within the universal and that it will give way to class, that race is something that can be bypassed. And of course, this deeply offends everyone who is a part of the anthology. And Amy Cicer, uh, the great uh, French poet and of course a writer of Discourse on Colonialism, mm-hmm. wrote this response called Solar Throat Slashed. And it sounds even better in French, believe it or not. Um, it's Do you know what it is uh, in French? It's like Solil de Coupe, it's something like that. It's like, like a, it's like the cut at the throat or something, but it's like, I don't know why he chose Solar Throat Slashed or English. I don't know, like so much of French English translation is bullshit. Like, I always wonder if we actually have a good like translation of Wretched of the Earth because like it's sometimes it's, I took two years of French. And it was fucking terrible. Never take French. <laughs> something useful. Like to all the students out there who are listening, take Spanish, do something. At least it's not, if you're going to study with a language, choose that language, have it planned out. I did French and I completely regretted it. <laughs> I, I don't, that's, that's one last personal story. I did German. I literally only use it to just say things in a stupid German accent. So... <laughs> <laughs> but but now I'm learning Spanish and it is incredibly useful and practical and opens up whole new worlds in a in a way that you just never got with those languages whenever I learned them. So no, I, I completely agree. Well, hot hot takes on <laughs> le- then, learning languages here tonight. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. Linguistics is actually what the episode is about. From here, I mean, there's a lot of things we can say about black skin and white mask, but uh, GCM really gets into the into the nitty gritty of Fanon's critiques of of Hegel in Black Skin, White Mask. And this is really understated. I always wonder how much he was influenced by people like, of course, he was deeply influenced, influenced by Freud. I mean, the guy was a psychologist, uh, but and maybe even we could just say he's a psychoanalyst. Mm-hmm. So what's happening is, I mean, uh, Fanon is obviously very critical of Hegel's master-slave dialectic, or Lord, Lord and Bondsman dialectic, as, as like Hegel would say. And mm-hmm. I think it was his phenomenology of spirit, if that's correct. Just to jump in and provide a little context. So yeah. the master-slave dialectic as like a core thing in Hegel is very much legacy of Kojev because Kojev was this primary teacher of Hegel to what became the existentialists, what became a lot of the French psychoanalytic thinkers. So that idea of the master-slave dialectic being the core thing in Hegel 
is very much the product of a very particular interpretation from Kojev, and it really influenced like this whole 20th century of, of French thought. So for me, that's, that's also helpful to think about considering how often we invoke that, and just to remember like that was very much the product of one particular academic teaching all of these people. Yeah, I don't know if you've had a chance to read uh, a totally different book. It's called Hegel, Haiti, and Universal History. I have um, read it, yep. So you know that Susan Buckmore is the writer. She makes that claim that Hegel was deeply influenced by the Haitian Revolution and is deeply influenced by like what was happening certainly during the French Revolution. But the Haitian Revolution was always like pretty much like around him. He had mm -hmm. he would always have he was, he was getting reports for years about it. But he didn't write explicitly about it because like the town he was living in got occupied by Napoleon, so he didn't want to get arrested. You know, you don't want to <laughs> when we get searched, you don't want to find those papers. I do wonder if then if Kojev's reading of of the Lord Bondsman dialectic as a as the master slave dialectic has, even if he didn't know it at the time, might have been like the the right interpretation of it. And certainly like this book hinges on that interpretation. Yeah, it's it's sort of like he was way more right than he knew or he was he like maybe didn't realize like how he did grasp the exact material relation and symbolic relation that Hegel was actually drawing on. I mean, it's an interesting idea. And I mean, yeah, obviously this built like uh, a lot of different uh, theoretical frameworks in, in comparative literature. And of course, like in, in, in for us, political theory, where I think it's much more useful. But this is what George talks a lot about here. And he doesn't say anything, I don't think, terribly new about it, though. And that's, I guess, one issue I took with this. But he does, yeah. uh, does he does point out that uh, Fanon is decolonizing Hegel's dialectic, and uh, from there, Fanon is able to build. Even though Black and White Mask was like a rejected dissertation, apparently, and then he had to write a totally new dissertation in two weeks. And then he got it, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine any PhD students doing that today. <laughs> it doesn't sound like the standard thing yeah. to do, especially for someone having a doctor, technically. So. Yeah. You know, I'll just say the standard RL line is that, you know, Fanon is just king shit and is just like absolutely <laughs> primary for anyone to read, period. So, I mean, he was absolutely fucking brilliant and a genius. So, I'm, I mean, if anyone could have done it, maybe it was Fanon. Yeah, absolutely. In the colonial context, the settler ends his work of breaking in the native when the latter admits loudly and intelligibly the supremacy of white man's values. For a colonized people, the most essential value, because the most concrete, is first and foremost the land, the land which will bring them bread and above all, dignity. But this dignity is nothing to do with the dignity of the human individual. For that human individual has never heard tell of it. All that the native has seen in his country is that they can freely arrest him, beat him, starve him, and no professor of ethics, no priest, has ever come to be beaten in his place, nor to share his bread with him. The well-known principle that all men are equal will be illustrated in the colonies from the moment that the native claims that he is the equal of the settler. The native intellectual had learned from his masters that the individual ought to express himself fully the colonialist bourgeoisie had hammered into the native's mind the essential qualities of the West, the idea of a society of individuals where each person shuts himself up in his own subjectivity, a society whose only asset is individual thought. You know, we haven't covered Fanon specifically on the show yet because a lot of other shows do like Wretched of the Earth, Black Sea and White Mass. So whenever Fanon talks about critiquing false universals as his mm -hmm. use of dialectics, how would you describe that for someone who hasn't read Fanon? Or like, what, like, what does that mean to critique a false universal? So a false universal would be something, the way universal gets used is it's used as the dialectic. And it's, it's also like a big French thing where like the French are like politically and theoretically and philosophically obsessed with the universal and universalism as, as like a, like universal rights and like mm -hmm. that sort of thing, especially via Rousseau. I, I more explicitly for uh, Fanon, uh, it also deals with this question of like, if you see the universal from Europe, you're only seeing a European particular. You're not seeing a world universal. Like you, if you're in Europe, you're European. You don't inherently understand the whole world via your own like uh, position. So he, he's also critical of it as something that's um, not only deals with something like a, a false universal, like race being only a particular within the dialectic, or something like that. Like it, like not just these questions of class, race, and nation, or even gender and sexuality we could throw in, but in maybe language in like global south, global north, mm -hmm. but also universal as a place from which you build your theories and like you build philosophy from, mm -hmm. and certainly political theory. 
and he's critical of doing that strictly from Europe because he's very critical, obviously, in Richard of the Earth of like um, the kind of European conceptions of, of the universal. It's, it's kind of like floods throughout that. And we get into more of that in the next chapter. But yeah, that's essentially where I got it from. Yeah, I think that's that's like beautifully said. Do you mind if I read a quote? Um, just since we're, we were talking about the function of violence for Sorel and we were critiquing Arendt. So I thought it might be helpful to think about what violence meant for Fanon, just to give it some context. So this is on 61. It's kind of like a medium-sized paragraph, but I think all of this just lays it out beautifully. It says, despite the fact that actual concrete violence lay almost exclusively on the side of whiteness, black resistance is always deemed violent, whatever form it takes. Violence in this sense need not be a physical imposition. It need not be a consequence of guns or other weapons of destruction. It need simply be appearance. For those relegated to non-being and condemned to invisibility, to even appear is a violent act because it is violent to the structures of the world and because it will inevitably be treated as such. Black subjects are thereby trapped in a catch-22, condemned to either accept inferiority or be demonized as violent. I think that for me was a really beautiful encapsulation of like why Fanon talks about violence and why it scared the shit out of everyone that you have this like radical black analyst who's basically writing revolutionary theory and just saying, yes, like revolutionary violence is necessary because of this sort of structure of colonialism. Yeah, I actually had that highlighted as well. So I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad that everything you've said so far has like been highlighted already by me, <laughs> like pretty much early before you even said yeah. this. That's kind of nice. Red Army um, faction unity right here. Yeah, that's right. I mean, <laughs> Uh, the, this ginger like <laughs> telepathic thing going on it's nice well you like know a month ahead of time as we were preparing we were just like highlighting probably at the same time being and non-being so you pointed out to this when you when you pointed out the sentence for those relegated to non-being and condemned to indivisibility to even appear as a violent act uh, non-being and in, in versus being is very important for this question well i wonder if there's a way that it you know if you think about it like what is being if not an ultimate universal what yeah. gets granted the status of being with a capital b you know even in heidegger right like the idea of there's like being being like capital B being and then there's all of us who partake or like share in that sort of logical like signification right but I, I think that's what's really radical for me is the idea of this is like precisely why Fanon is so important and even if you think about things like Afro pessimism and such right and like the categories of social death it's like the whole point is that like there is a group of people who don't ever get included in the basic ontological principles of what it is to exist and and it's always this like outside like terrifying potentially completely destructive sort of zone you know it's like the thing that is underneath yeah. of like what even gets to exist in the first place yeah and this speaks to kind of his like pess optimism i mean like uh, fanon is very much like a pessimist but he's also like not a total i wouldn't I, I, he gets used a lot for Afro pessimism, and we could talk more about Afro pessimism. And I don't have a whole lot to say on it, but like other than the fact that like I think Fanon is far more of an optimist than they than they led on with him. In the black and white mask, it does not feel that way. Mm -hmm. But uh, in in part, in let a lot of like I think some of it is more optimistic than it seems. More optimistic than it seems. And I think Richard of the Earth is far more optimist as well. But that's uh, that's another question regarding like you know the works of like Frank Wilderson and a few other folks who write yeah. about uh, Afro uh, write about Afro pessimism and Fanon in particular and you utilize Fanon in that way. Decolonization never takes place unnoticed, for it influences individuals and modifies them fundamentally. It brings a natural rhythm into existence, introduced by new men, and with it, a new language and a new humanity. I'm going I'm to read one more quote really fast. So this is GCM on 63. Okay. He says, rather than establishing hierarchical distinctions that disqualify a part of humanity from access to being, this is like Fanon's violence. This is a violence that undoes the very same exclusionary barriers, tearing down the ontological walls, separating being from mere non-beings, and setting the two once more into dialectical motion. This is a violence, in other words, that operates towards decolonization of being. So for me, that was a really great encapsulation of like, this is what Fanon is kind of doing in his process of, of dialectical decolonization. Yeah, this is, this is why uh, the young Marxists, the young lefties need to read this book then. This is, this is a chance to like really think through these questions. Yeah. I do like the fact that GCM is very like, I mean, he must have been preparing this. I mean, his dissertation probably took a couple of years to write this mm -hmm. and he must have written it prior to 2017. But like uh, he does use an example of, of Mike Brown being murdered in Ferguson. And I'll read a quote from GCM right click on 61. When the unarmed black teenager Mike Brown was murdered in Ferguson, Missouri, for example, the conservative pundit Ben Stein went so far as to insist that Brown was indeed, quote, armed with his incredibly strong, scary self, unquote. And then GCM continues, as is too often the case, satirical news outlet The Onion offered the best diagnosis not only of Stein's comments, but the broader equivalence between blackness and violence when it ran the headline, quote, our nation's unarmed teens 
are they armed, unquote, above with above an image of a young black man. Uh, yeah. So shout out to the youngin too um, for yeah. for throwing like uh, hot picks, especially the past couple of years. I guess they've gotten better, but uh, I thought that was great for understanding like being and non being. Yeah, yeah. Just to exist is to be a threat. I had some stuff on sixty six. Do it. I'm trying to see exactly how useful this is. I'll just read one quote here because um, we were talking about Cesare a little bit too. You know, the idea that the break with Sartre and some of these, like, thinkers of negritude, like, caused them to leave the Communist Party. And, and it really was a fundamental yeah. break. And so this is GCM talking about uh, Fanon here. He says, just as Fanon reformulated Hegel to accommodate black experience, Cesare would come to insist on the need to, quote, particularize communism, unquote, and to complete Marx in a way that would meet the needs of black revolutionaries. So for me, I think that's a really interesting thing to think about, like, the quote, unquote, like, you know, and I say this sarcastically, the race versus class debate, like it's interesting to think about what happened wasn't like a complete abandonment of like a revolutionary Marxist politics at the time. It was, no, we need to particularize this for us to make sense for black revolutionaries, which I think is a really, really important leap that that Cesare made. When Cesare discusses, um, I think he, in that same letter to in his resignation letter to the Communist Party of France, he says he believes in a universal rich with every particular and that it, it, it reinforces that very notion. Um, and I think the universal rich with every particular is, yeah, it, this is uh, essentially what the whole book is summed up a universal rich with every particular because it's not as if they give up on universalism yeah mm-hmm. universalism is still there in the background it's still like the higher end but the question of how to get there via their i mean as you pointed out they're like the specific places from which they're doing that mm-hmm. is very important i think fanon mentions in wretched of the earth something like uh when we talk about marx in in the colonial world we have to stretch marx we have to uh take him and like stretch the definition i mean we're having to stretch the definition of dialectics right now compared to my old like comrades um as they would say but uh, that's what's been happening here, and I think it's very important you pointed that out. And then from here, I have nothing really till chapter three. Uh, so chapter three, I mean, this is like his GCM's wrapping up of Fanon's uh, ouvrage, his whole work, really, especially around Wretched of the Earth, and taking that, and especially like taking, I mean, that first chapter is like famous concerning violence. I mean, that's mm-hmm. like the book you read when you read Fanon. You, you use the first chapter, and, and then everyone normally just puts it down after that. They should read the whole thing. Yeah, so the whole thing is great. Especially if they're interested in psychoanalysis, you know, in questions of like what happens after in the post-colonial nation. And Fanon is like not afraid to take shots at people. Like, I mean, if we want to see shots fired, I mean, that's, that's it's that, I think it's that second chapter where he's ripping on the what would become the kind of post-colonial national bourgeoisie uh, mm-hmm. in places like Algeria and like, in, and I think he was mentioning particularly like Ghana and some other places uh, where he was very critical of uh, what follows. This is just to say everyone should read Wretched of the Earth, even if we don't cover it on the show. Yeah. Please, for the love of the all gods, read Wretched of the Earth. Yes, especially if you think class is more important than race. I don't know how many of our listeners actually would think that, but just in case, just in case, like you feel that way or you feel it's just a little bit more important, yeah. You know, do yourself a favor. Read Wretched of the Earth. Just read the first chapter. Maybe you'll f- read the whole book. You should read the whole book, but everyone reads the first chapter anyway, so fuck it. We expect you to just read that anyway. Just do it. It's, <laughs> it's okay. This and then that, you know, it's like <laughs> it's the postmodern father, you know, like Zizek, you know, <laughs> versus the dictatorial father. We expect you to do this, but you're going to do this instead. It's okay. Yeah, it's like, um, listen, you know, if you really love your revolutionary politics, we're just saying it'd be really great if you read Wretched of the Earth. It's really up to you. We're not saying you have to do it, but it'd be really great if you did. That's all we're saying. <laughs> now they have to do it. Now we've like implied that they have to. This is yeah. so terrible. Well, now again, we're like good. the locus of authority is now internalized and now it's going to terrorize them if they don't do it. We're great Stalinists. I like this. Yeah, this we're, we're Zizekians. We're postmodern Zizekian Stalinists right now. <laughs> Ideology. We are exactly what Jordan Peterson was against. This is a positive thing to be. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Something that, uh, that GCM hits on in this next chapter is actually, I mean, aside from like discussing Wretched of the Earth, he also hits a lot on uh, C.L.R. James's book, Black Jacobins. And that's also fucking required reading for listeners. Please fucking read Black Jacobins. It's the book on the Haitian Revolution. No other book gets really close to it in, mm-hmm. in historiography anyway, but also because it's so beautifully written. It's so passionate. The prose is nice. Uh, he writes it kind of like a novelist. It's It's fun and easy to read and you it's not as complex as it seems even though there is a ton of detail to it it is a good way to kind of build uh around questions of like dialectics and certainly the master slave dialectic um erupting in practice where the reverse and then we're not so much where like the slave becomes the master but we're wherever where the slave is no longer a slave and the master gets thrown out which is, yeah. is beautiful 
Shout yeah, out to the Haitians. Big um, shout out, Haitian revolutionaries, still with us as our ancestors. Um, I will say, too, that for anyone listening, we actually did a Red Library book group. Our very first book group that we do through the Discord for patrons was on Black Jacobins. So there's a history with us sort of off of the show of actually us studying uh, CLR James as well. So big shout out. But shout out to the reading group fam. Holla. Okay, so actually Zizek, actually, it's funny we mentioned Zizek. So Zizek is actually a, a target for GCM in this book mm-hmm. because Zizek is very much, and also Alain Badu. Alain Badu and, and Zizek are both very much universalists. Mm-hmm. And they they almost like envision, I mean, they wouldn't say a universal rich with every particular. They would they believe in more of like a very flat universalism, I think. as a, Maybe GCM just puts it this way. I, I've never read anything by Zizek or Badu on universalism, so I won't try to make any big critiques of those two um also because it's a very daunting task to make critiques of either one i don't even understand set theory much less but do generally so <laughs> I, I think, I think most I mathematicians would say that bad you doesn't understand set theory <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so big old shots fired at Elaine Badu, who is a big influence on me. I love him with his old ass. So <laughs> I do too, yeah. <laughs> I will say it is interesting, you know, because one of the things that maybe isn't always clear about someone like Zizek, I think Badu maybe more, it's at the forefront, but with Zizek, I really do think something that most people don't grasp is like, it is really, I think one of his primary political philosophical projects is to grapple with how do you be a universalist now with Lacanian theory with sort of the history of like post-colonialism I mean I think he does like argue very strongly against like other ideas of like particular versus universal but I do think it's interesting you know agree with him or not that that's I think really that's what it's about it is really about how do we talk about universals as revolutionary anti-capitalist sorts of thinkers yeah and that becomes pretty clear in uh if on page 76 I want to uh, quote maybe this one, actually I'll put, quote this whole paragraph because it's do really it. good so GCM says quote this was uh in, regarding a poem about Haiti, but uh, this was hardly the first time a Haitian had seized upon the liberatory symbols of Europe to put to new decolonial use. Think of the dumbfounded French soldiers hearing Toussaint's troops, their own barbarous, quote, barbarous enemies, unquote, singing the Marseille and wondering if they might not be the ones with justice on their side. Or think more generally of the concrete content with which the rebels of Saint-Domingue had filled abstract values like liberty, equality, and fraternity, whereas Slavoj Zizek reduces this moment to a, quote, underlying scenes, unquote. Cicer himself, Amy Cicer, is much closer to the point, where Cicer says, quote, to prevent the development of all national consciousness in the colonized, the colonizer pushes the colonized to desire an abstract equality, but equality refuses to remain abstract, and what an affair it is when the colonized takes back the word on his own account to demand that it not remain a mere word. Unquote. Hot um, so, hot. yeah, hot shit right there. I mean, Zizek also makes a point to uh, talk about. I don't. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that like a few of your listeners are gonna be very familiar with like this this ED incident in uh, certainly in Black Jacobins, but certainly talked about across the Haitian Revolution of this moment where this Polish regiment, which was a part of Napoleon's army, uh, actually abandons the French military and in Napoleon's side and sides with the Haitian revolutionaries. And uh, Zizek says, well, look, see, this is what uh, universalism is. This is like the universal moment in which uh, the Polish become the Haitians, essentially, like in mm-hmm. practice, like they they, be, they take on this new identity, despite uh, their previous backgrounds and where they came from. He also talks a lot about the Haitian constitution in regards to this, but that's an, that's an outlying argument to get into. Um, and GCM doesn't touch on like questions of constitutionalism, even though he's a political theorist, yeah, which is yeah. kind of nice because like most political science professors are like, oh, this is really, like, they want to discuss the rights and like questions of like constitutions and like how to write constitutions and anyway, freedom and, and all that. I have a, a question for you. Would you say that maybe a lot of times whenever decolonial perspectives and or like post-colonial perspectives and like more like Marxist or, you know, dialectical sorts of frameworks, Would you say that it's typically cast as like a debate about universals versus particulars? It it seems that way, at least within academia, from the outside looking in. I'm not in the academy, but (laughs) I haven't damned myself yet. Yeah, it does seem that way, uh, at least certainly like in, in literature. Uh, in, in comparative literature, the way they talk about this question of like post-colonialism and Marxism um, does get thrown in, into these questions around like the post-colonialist critiquing the Marxist by a different um, literary thinkers and then vice versa with the with some of the more Marxist um, comparative literature uh, academics. So that, that, that does seem to be a big thing. That's, I guess, maybe a sim- it's a simplistic way to look at it, but I do think there is some truth to it that like sometimes the way that it gets cast is if it's this like 
yeah, the struggle over like the universal perspective versus the particular. So I think what's kind of interesting about reading Cesare and like Zizek together is that, well, it seems like it's really about how they relate to each other, which is a bit more complicated than than maybe the, the more simplistic ways that the debate gets framed. Yeah, I can't think of any other ways I would, I would compare the two. I'm trying to like think of that. But uh, although I just as like a side topic, I wonder how influential something like psychoanalysis as as a set of theories and certainly even Jacques Lacan was and would have been probably because would have Fanon would have been around like those same intellectual circles in Paris, how influential a Canadian theory might have been on black skin, white mask and certainly like some of the questions that surround that. I think that's something you're digging into at a different point, but it's just something that just occurred to me. Well, yeah. maybe that's something we'll uh, we'll figure out a way to talk through some of that stuff together. I mean, we are having like debates, you know, and sort of discussions around psychoanalysis and decolonial perspectives and some of the, you know, some of the discussions we're having on Discord and some of the writing and, and sort of offline discussions. So I'm sure we're going to see that come out on the show at some point too. But it'd be interesting, I think, to read some psychoanalytic texts along with decolonial perspectives or like Fanon and kind of to think about what would it have been like like to, to sort of see those two actually inform each other, like to be in discussion with each other. Uh, and just to mention, uh, just because I want to give a shout out to uh, a, a professor who I knew before I was a student at University of Houston, a guy named uh, uh, Dr. Dewey Lep Nguyen, who is doing uh, work on a guy named Tren Doc Dao, who was a uh, Vietnamese philosopher who wrote a book on uh, phenomenology and Marxism in like the 1920s. And there's only like one translation of it into English. It was translated like, and it's not a great translation, but um, he's doing a biography of him. But uh, apparently that was very influential on like Jacques Derrida and on uh, many of the uh, more post-structuralist thinkers via phenomenology and Marxism. And so it, it would be interesting to uncover these like Parisian cafe circles that were probably very big uh, yeah, during absolutely. these different periods. Right. So where do you want to go uh, next? From here, I mean, he doesn't, the thing is, and this is like a big critique I have of this book is that like, he doesn't say anything terribly new with Fanon. Mm-hmm. And I wish he did. But I mean, other than like the influence of Sorel and uh, certainly his use of like mixing in uh, different parts of Fanon's different theories with Maria Tigui and with uh, en- Enrique Dussel. And we'll get into Enrique Dussel probably next. But yeah, uh, mm-hmm. yeah I, I wasn't actually that impressed with some of this. Like, it's like I like this is kind of stuff I expected to read if I were doing this my, I'm by myself and I'm not a, uh, I don't have a PhD. But I, I mean, his analysis is all correct. I, and I think this is all great stuff for someone like coming in and like, uh, reading Fanon through, uh, certainly through a scholar of Fanon, uh, mm. I, th- I think all of this is like accurate. And I, don't, I don't want any issue with it. It just seems doesn't seem new. I, did you get the feeling that this was that any of this was new to you? Uh, if you've read a lot of this kind of work, I mean, not necessarily. I, I do think it, you know, maybe in true PhD dissertation fashion, you're just basically going to be like, well, I'm going to recapitulate this person's whole fucking argument as like one part of my dissertation and then I'll move on to the next thinker. So, I mean, I I do think I said this about, you know, Saito's book too, you know, it it reads like a PhD thesis and not that that's necessarily a bad thing. If you're not super familiar with Fanon and like situating Fanon in this particular approach that he's doing, I think it's actually like a really thorough, really, I think effective chapter, like getting you like familiar with Fanon's perspective and his arguments, even if it doesn't necessarily do anything new. So, you know, it's kind of like take that for what it's worth, I guess. Yeah, I completely agree with. And then for, uh, I guess, the younger viewers who, uh, since we're trying to encourage young people to, to to read different things and like maybe maybe watch different things, uh, there was, it was done by, I think it was like a Swedish or maybe it was a Danish director, but it was a, it's a, there's this documentary called Reflections on Violence and Lauren Hill of all people uh, narrates it. And I was surprised that her narrating is even, is just as beautiful as her singing. So if anyone wants to hear a beautiful narrator, like Lauren Hill is wonderful. She reads out the first chapter of Fanon's Richard of the Earth, Reflections on Violence via these old, it's kind of like archived like films mm-hmm. of like colonialism across uh uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. I've seen that documentary more times than I can count. So I'm actually really glad you plugged that because I was hoping we'd get a chance to reference it because to me, it, it is such an amazing way to present Fanon and the power of the imagery and like third world struggles and like guerrilla movements that were like fighting fucking colonialism. Really, it's truly sublime to me. So I'll put a link in the show notes. I haven't been able to find a free version of the whole thing yet, but uh, we are going to do a, a Red Library Cinema movie night on that sometime soon. Maybe after we do this this episode and it comes out, since it'll be very appropriate. Yeah, it would be. Actually, uh, for those who can't find a link, uh, I know that some universities have, I, I think most universities go through a site called Canopy, and that's spelled with a K. Um, and Canopy has it for sure. I don't know if, for those listening, if, if your institution has it. I know like a lot of public libraries go through Canopy as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So even if you're not you should be able to access it via that way, assuming your library will do it. And if not, you can like, you know, push your library. Hey, you should like buy this so we can view it. 
Yeah, it's worth the effort to go out of the way. I'll tell you, the first time we, I watched that, or uh, the second time, is with a, a group of friends who, you know, also are like kind of comrades, and we have organized together in different ways. A friend of mine was watching it, and his family were missionaries. They were Christian missionaries. And there's a scene whenever they're talking to some, the I think it was the white South Africans, and he's watching, and you could tell he was having an existential meltdown because he was listening to them speak, and he's like, that is my aunt and uncle. That literally, I've heard them say the same things. They look the same. And you you can tell he just had this like reckoning with his own family's like colonial history by like having this weird moment of like just seeing how similar they were to his family members it was it was actually one of the things i remember looking at him as he was watching that scene and it was really unforgettable wow yeah i mean this is all more to watch that uh, documentary for everyone yeah. listening okay so I, i'm ready to move on to uh, the next chapter Let's on chapter it. four um on particularly on latin on latin america let's see it was called latin american dialectics and the other Native society is not simply described as a society lacking in values. The native is declared insensible to ethics. He represents not only the absence of values, but also the negation of values. All values, in fact, are irrevocably poisoned and diseased as soon as they are allowed in contact with the colonized race. The customs of the colonized people, their traditions, their myths, above all, their myths, are the very sign of that poverty of spirit. As soon as the native begins to cause anxiety to the settler, he is handed over to well-meaning souls who point out to him the wealth of Western values. I speak of the Christian religion, and no one need be astonished. The church and the colonies is the white people's church, the foreigner's church. She does not call the native to God's ways, but to the ways of the white man, of the master, of the oppressor. And as we know, in this matter, many are called, but few chosen. And so here he draws a lot on uh, the Argentine philosopher Enrique Dussel. And this this is, is a guy who I really had never even heard his name before until I read this book like mm. three years ago originally when this came out. And Dussel is very interesting. So Dussel, he's kind of like your average academic philosopher. But the thing is that like he was also very involved in these conferences for se several years in like the mid 60s that were run by these Catholic priests ac across Latin America and a lot of student revol and would be student revolutionaries and certainly revolutionaries and guerrillas later across Latin America. And uh, Enrique Dussel, I think he was very young, he's like 32 years old. So he was teaching them all lectures on world history that would um, that emphasize the role of Latin America in world history. And from there, he actually builds uh, this book called Philosophy of Liberation, which is originally written in, in Spanish in 1968. I have a 1980 version of it in English, but he actually was teaching future saint Oscar Romero mm. in those classes, which I thought was just like, like stunning that like he was that close to the guy. Yeah, uh, I mean, I was in El Salvador uh, back in December visiting my fiance's family for two weeks and like you can't not see Oscar Romero's name everywhere on the airport, on the freeway. You can't help but see statues of him in towns. You can't, like when you see like the big kind of churches, they're always Catholic churches that are like in the town squares they always, a lot of them have like gigantic, like 10 by 12 foot portraits of Romero. And I just thought this was a very interesting tidbit, but like, you can also go in there and like, uh, of course, cause he's a saint, he's been, he's been made a saint recently in the past couple of years, uh, where you can make prayers on the one hand to Virgen de Guadalupe, on the other hand, you can make prayers to uh, St. Oscar Romero. So I think it's very mm. interesting that Dussel taught this guy world history and that like, of course, Romero had such a huge historical impact, not just on El Salvador, but across Latin America. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in 1973, Enrique Dussel's house was bombed by uh, the far right in Argentina. And uh, he actually, that led him to flee into exile into Mexico. And then two years later in Argentina, they had that big military coup. Mm -hmm. um, so he left at the right time, certainly. Okay, so I had this quote from uh, GCM about Enrique Dussel. The impact of the blast, that bomb blast, was more than merely biographical or even psychological. It was inscribed in the book's form, Philosophy of Liberation as well. While, while undeniably systematic, systematic philosophy of liberation is also uncharacteristically terse due in large part to the fact that Dussel's personal library including his complete works of Hegel and Marx have been blown into the street left 
unbound by the bomb. Mm. Dusso often holds up these bomb damaged books before his students. It's hard to imagine a more effective demonstration of the mutual imbrication of theory and practice. And I thought that was a nice tidbit from yeah. uh, GCM about yeah. Dusso. Yeah, and um, actually, right before that, too, I, I, you know, one of the things that this chapter and the next one were my favorites. Um, like by far, because I guess like theoretically thinking about, okay, so we're talking about dialectics and decolonization for, for Dussel. The way that Dussel turned to Emmanuel Levinas, who is a incredibly influential philosopher, a student of Heidegger, who really, because of Heidegger's, you know, basically support of the, the National Socialist Party and like joining and becoming a Nazi, he really focused on this sort of like phenomenology of being that was really focused on like turning towards the other, you know, this sort of exteriority. And this actually, this is already influencing a lot of shit that I'm writing even right now, but this sort of turn from the dialectic to what he calls the analectic, which is this sort of progressive movement outward towards exteriority and towards the other. And I just found this to be a really, really uh, powerful idea of a way of kind of looking at dialectics or sort of returning it back out in this way that's like more communal focused, more like ethically oriented, because Levinas is kind of a philosopher of like a kind of like ontological ethics. So to me, this is like a really fascinating thing that, that GCM is doing is to sort of flesh out this this shift for Dussel. Yeah, I mean, and that shift uh, ends up playing out politically in uh, a book of his that Dussel writes called 20 Theses on Politics. And that's also a pretty good book for like the, <laughs> for, like, the young lefties to read. It's, uh, it has this big focus on something that the Zapatistas talk about, even Evo Morales in Bolivia talked about a lot, uh, Pobre Obedential, which is like obeying power, in which um, rather than like people having like, like the kind of Nietzschean will to power, it's something that's more around the question of, like if you're a politician, it's not a career, it's more of like a, uh, in there because you're there via the people. Mm -hmm. And the people actually, pay, El Pueblo is very big um, in this chapter too, we'll get to that in a second. But this kind of uh, obeying power in terms of obeying the people and the people's will is something that's a big part of like this kind of analectical thinking. Uh, that I think that certainly Evo Morales draws on. And I, I mentioned Evo Morales because like he apparently Dussel is kind of a celebrity among the uh, kind of pink tide governments. Apparently mm -hmm. he gets invited. He got invited a lot to like Ecuador and Uruguay and Bolivia and certainly Venezuela many times. Dussel had a huge impact on, on the way some of these uh, leaders were thinking. Uh, I know Hugo Chavez made all of his ministers read one of his books at one point. <laughs> so, you know, Chavez is a comrade. He he fucking reads. He knows what's up. Yeah, he does. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, I, I want to read a quick just passage here just to talk about why analectics is sort of talked about as a as an approach to decolonizing Levinas, like decolonizing the dialectic for Dussel. So this is on... Um, 110. He says, here to sell suspicion towards dialectics, whose, quote, proper sphere is the ontological, unquote, whose proper category is totality and whose operational, quote, principle is that of identity and difference, unquote, is already perfectly clear. Dialectical difference understood as an internally determined relation is a category of the same. In this view, dialectics is, is therefore always dangerously colonial because it is internal to the system and points always toward resolution through the gradual and self-same expansion of that system. And then at the very end, he says, like Foucault and arg arguably Levinas as well, Dussel here presents an, an oversimplified view in which there is only one possible dialectics, conservative and totalizing, contained within the bounds of a totality that divides cleanly and without remainder, and whose motion, rather than incessant, open-ended, and unpredictable, is a stale and mechan mechanical expansion of the same. I kind of wanted to ask you, and, and this was like why I found this really interesting, Interesting. We've been reading a lot of Todd McGowan on our Capitalism and Desire reading series. And, you know, McGowan's whole read of Hegel and his whole idea of dialectics is that there is never this closure. It is always incessant. It is contradictions are always there. And so I was kind of like curious about this because it seems that for GCM, he's trying to say that a decolonized dialectic like has those qualities, right? Like it is never done. It is always open. It is always incessantly in motion. And I couldn't help but think, you know, I really love that idea of like, that's a way to decolonize the dialectic. And then it made me think for someone like McGowan, I wonder if he thinks of his dialectic as decolonized. And, and if and if not, why not? That's a good question. Not that you're going to have an answer for that, but it's interesting because we're talking about dialectics so much with McGowan. It's like, oh, yeah, this is this radical way to think about it is in this mode. And it's kind of like, well, I mean, it seems like it's been a decolonized way to think about it for quite some time, even though we don't encounter it that way. You know, if we only read like McGowan and Hegel and a lot of like more U.S. and like Western European thinkers. Yeah, uh, I think it's something that's something worth exploring. I think Tom McGowan would probably agree with that. I, I'm not mm -hmm. sure exactly how close Tom McGowan is to, to a lot of the 
uh, questions that are posed by like people who are like in the Caribbean philosophical society and groups like that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. around the. But yeah, I think I think that's a, a question worth exploring for sure, especially for those who have been reading Tom McGowan uh, a lot. That's what I was thinking too. It's just to think about you know, there's a whole other way to come at this, which is a decolonial perspective, which is like wanting to do the same thing to the to the dialectic. Maybe it's it's, but it's coming from this other angle that is incredibly important to. To, to explore and to put yourself in relation to, I think. Uh, what would Tom McGowan, what do you think he would say at least on the question of like teleology? Do you think he's a teleological thinker? Or think he's more anti-teleological? I, th- I would describe him and in, in the reading of him and listening to him talk about what he means by dialectics. I would say he's, he seems to be a profoundly anti-teleological thinker. The whole reason why he says he's not a Marxist is because, I mean, I think this is a misread of Marx personally, but he basically says that Marx's dialectic searches for closure like it postulates an end and i'm just like i don't i mean i don't agree with that in my reading of marx um especially as marx evolves but i i think he very much sees himself as not engaging in a dialectical approach that would offer any kind of closure absolutely and in terms of like a dialectics that never close and kind of a dialectics that are like combative and always kind of moving in that way um i i mentioned this to you like i think first discussed starting this book a uh, the French uh, dubbed movie from 1973, I think, is called Can Dialytics Break Bricks? Oh, I love which it. Which is yeah. like this, which is this like dubbed, like it's kind of like cheesy and corny in some way, but uh, it's a great like French dub movie over like a Korean anti colonial movie mm-hmm. um, that deals with like uh, the Japanese colonization of Korea. But um, it's it's a fantastic film, and I, I recommend people if they really want to like see what dialytics, this kind of dialytics, or maybe even Todd McGowan's dialytics looks like in motion. Uh, then watching that movie would be pretty key for them. Uh, yeah, so you can find that in its completeness on YouTube. I'll post a link in it. That actually was a film from The Situationist, and it was an example of the deterrent, where the idea was you're like going to subvert something and make it absurd. So it, to me, it's an amazing <laughs> thing to watch, and it's so satirical. And if you're familiar with anything about like leftist political history, especially in France, it's fucking hilarious. It is literally like one of my is one of the funniest satirical left wing revolutionary things I've ever seen. So I guess maybe the question you do bring up a good point, and maybe this is, I'm just going to throw this out as a question to stimulate further discussion down the road. I do wonder if for McGowan, even if he would say that his dialectics is open and always in movement and it never fully resolves, I'm not really sure he would describe it as combative. Like that's something he doesn't ever describe dialectics in that way from my, my reading of him, which is not complete. But I do wonder if that's an element here that you won't find him again. There's a combative element to it. And to me, it's interesting to think about where that particular aspect of it is very specifically in this decolonial sort of frame. I'm sure he's... He's alive, right? I don't know how old Tom McGowan is or when he was writing his books. Oh, um, he's still around. Yeah, I think he's probably like he's in his like 40s, 50s or something. Okay, then he's probably fully aware of what's been happening in this country the past few months. So yeah. I think, yeah. I would I would think that like uh, he would think through political sequences as something very combative and, mm-hmm. and violent almost. Like, yeah. it, like it actually needs it, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. anyway, it's yeah. yeah interesting thing just to think about, again, like these sort of just nuances in how we think about what dialectics is and like what are the almost like the qualities of it that seem to kind of shift depending on who's reading the dialectic you're actually engaging with maybe yeah now i need to read tom mcgowan i'm missing out so like i I feel compelled now to read him (laughs) honestly capitalism of desire is a fantastic book and i think it's a really great example of of mcgowan's whole project so he also his book emancipation after hegel uh, which is like his book his very philosophical book on the dialectic, which I've only read bits and pieces of, but I know some good comrades and uh, friends of Red Library have been reading that pretty closely. So, but I do think McGowan is a, I mean, it's it's a really great presentation of Lacanian concepts. So I, w- I would definitely recommend that as like the primary starting point. From here, I guess, uh, talking about Enrique Dussel, I wanted to uh, kind of deal with this kind of like tension between the two two terms we've been using kind of like synonymously which are post-colonial theory and decolonial theory where decolonial theory for Dussel is something very specific and different from something like post-colonial theory and for him the decolonizing turn in philosophy is an epistemological one 
So, I mean, we discussed earlier the, the kind of like ego cogito of the you occupy position where you see the universal from your location and you think that's universal, but it's just a particular, it's a false universal, that sort of thing. And the kind of like Eurocentrism that comes out of that particular. But mm-hmm. Dussel actually hits on this a lot with, uh, and this shows up, I, I believe in this chapter, I think it does, I think it's where I first saw it, was this question of, in the, of Rene Descartes' uh, Je pense donc je suis, I think therefore I am. And Dussel says the I think therefore I am could only been uh, preceded uh, by kind of a realizing who you are through another. In this case, mm-hmm. it had to be preceded by the I conquer, therefore I am. It had to be preceded by 1492, by 1516, by and particularly like Columbus, and of course, like the expulsion of, of the Arabs uh, and the Moors out of Spain in 1492 and uh, 1516, the conquest of what becomes later Mexico. That's very key for decolonizing everything that comes afterwards for Dussel and and decolonizing philosophy in Latin America and building a Latin American philosophy. Uh, Because he says it's a philosophy that would have to completely turn on its head European epistemology, which is like why he's so influential on liberation theologists like Gustavo Gutierrez and Oscar Romero Mm. uh, is because he's hitting on this question of like, okay, how is it like, I mean, obviously it's a big contradiction for Cortez to walk into into the Aztec empire with a sword in one hand and a cross in the other. Mm. Um, and that this is something, this is, you know, it's kind of like a pretty basic uh, point that like, obviously the like, Christianity is different from Christianity. And this is something that he differentiates. Christianity is something more along the lines of like, it's kind of like pure concepts that are used in liberation theology. And Christendom is that um, kind of like centralized colonial state apparatus within, I mean, even we could say it's part of the Byzantine Empire and the Roman Empire, but that's a whole other set of questions, <laughs> but yeah. um, uh, certainly play out strongly in, in a place like the Americas. So this question of like the epistemological turn is very key for getting to a decolonial theory overall for Enrique Dussel and for this book as well. Yeah, I really don't have a whole lot on Enrique Dussel, although I really like him, because we already hit on the question of analectics um, mm-hmm. and a dialectics and um, the question of, of Descartes, which is very important for him. Now, someone you did read who's very important for this book, uh, Nelson Maldonado Torres. You've read mm-hmm. his book. Um, yeah. What's it called again? Against War. Yeah, he was actually GCM's uh, dissertation advisor. So. <laughs> I'm, now that I look back on it, it's just so interesting to me that I like found that book and then you know now I've read this considering the connection between the two. It's, it's really timely. <laughs> yeah. You know, actually, uh, do you mind if I tag a quick quote before we move on? And to me, this is just yeah. like a really great little encapsulation of, I guess like Dussel's eventually what we're, GCM's moving toward, which is, sort of like a, a decolonizing of analectics to what we're going to call anadialectical liberation. And he says, anadialectical liberation is quote-unquote barbarian, not only in its appeal to the nothingness of what lay beyond the walls, to the banished zone of non-being, but also in its quote-unquote trans-ontological movement to abolish those walls themselves, rather than a vestige of the past, today's barbarians are a vision of the impending and even more universal future, which I just thought was fucking heavy metal and a really great encapsulation of like the core of this chapter's approach or like, here's what to take in terms of decolonizing the dialectic. Absolutely. Yeah, if you're down to go to the next chapter. Yeah, this is yeah, you're, with the combative you're, dialectics. You're driving this thing, comrade. So I'm ready when you are. Okay, good. I don't want to like wear you out. So I was like, all right, I got to keep this this vehicle on the road. You know, I got to keep it in fucking called. It's gotten to that point. Um, what's it called? <laughs> uh, uh, when you just leave the car and and it's going like 60 miles an hour and you can just keep it going at 60. It's called automatic drive. No, what's it called? Cruise control. Cruise control. Yeah. We're in cruise control. I don't know what the fucking words are, but it's fucking cruise control. Ah, words so are fucking made up are. anyway. Who cares? Why don't we just call it automatic drive? That just sounds easier to me. It's just like... I don't know. Probably some marketing bullshit. They probably... They did a bunch of market... I know, it's terrible. They did a bunch bunch of market research and they realized if you call it cruise control, more people will buy the car versus automatic drive. (laughs) That makes sense. I'm glad they don't set for planes because autopilot makes far more sense. (laughs) Yeah, Um, exactly. Come, comrades. The European game is finally over. We must look for something else. We can do anything today provided we do not ape Europe, provided we are not obsessed with catching up with Europe. Europe has gained such a mad and reckless momentum that it has lost control and reason and is heading at a dizzying speed towards the brink from which we would be advised to remove ourselves as quickly as possible. Europe undertook the leadership of the world with ardor, cynicism, and violence. Look at how the shadow of its palaces stretches and multiplies. We must shake off the heavy darkness in which we were cast and leave it behind. Yet it is very true that we need a model and that we want blueprints and examples. For many among us, 
the European model was the most inspiring. But when we search for humanity in the technique and style of Europe, we see only a succession of negations of humanity and an avalanche of murders. Venezuela's combative dialectics. And I thought this was like a really interesting chapter. I mean, mm -hmm. his books, Building the Commune, and then his other one, We Created Chavez, are very much heavily influential on his uh, understanding of dialectics. I mean, he may have even had like a slightly different thesis or dissertation when he was originally writing it but like from what i read he actually uh stopped his dissertation halfway through flew to venezuela and became a professor at the school of planning um this university of planning apparently in, in venezuela somewhere in caracas and taught there for like a year and just wrote a totally different book instead of his dissertation so i thought that was like <laughs> this guy is like super bold obviously like you know like I mean, I don't got, think he's afraid to like take shots and do certain things. Yeah, no, I mean, again, like we were saying, he's definitely like not your typical academic in the best sense of that phrase. I mean, he really does seem, I guess like what I came away with in this book, and I think it's really like potent in the theorizing, is he has a deep passion and commitment to revolutionary politics, to decolonization, to like developments of the Chavistas in Venezuela. And I think it, it's, to me, this is one of the best examples of what really contextualized like embedded theorizing in the world looks like and what it sounds like and what it reads like. So I think that's why I came away with enormous respect for him because to me, it's just not very often you can feel the materiality in the theorizing. And I think it really comes through. Yeah. I mean, I think GCM is a good example of an organic intellectualism in practice on the left. Yeah. I think so, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So obviously he wants to start with where everyone on the left, even uh, when we discussed Venezuela starts, which is 1989, uh, which is the, this, this singular moment of the kind of rejection of the IMF adjustments that were thrown on to uh, the Venezuelan working class. And the, and I mean, also like that, that class that we wouldn't call necessarily a proletariat, but like kind of a sub proletariat or something mm -hmm. like that. But what happens is in the Caracazo is this massive popular rebellion against the uh against that kind of washington consensus of like structural adjustment and like raising uh bus fees especially bus fees that was the big thing cutting yeah. social programs but especially bus fees because they ended up setting a bunch of buses on fire mm -hmm. uh for like a few days and like, attacking bus drivers <laughs> I, I was wondering when this happened that nicolas maduro was uh, still a bus driver during this point and what his perspective would have been but um it's it's interesting that like the former bus driver who would have been attacked during the caracazo is now the president of venezuela <laughs> yeah. it's kind of a interesting irony of history and he discusses uh venezuelan history via this kind of like anti-teleological spiral where he starts uh, with 1989 and then it moves uh, from 1989 the Caracazo with this kind of expl explosion in Caracas literally the Caracazo moves into uh, this period where nothing happens for a few years um, but you, you see like social movements are gaining ground but that's mm -hmm. about it uh, by 1992 the recently radicalized Hugo Chavez attempts, uh, and future president Hugo Chavez, I mean, uh, attempts a coup d'etat and is, he fails, uh, goes on TV. I think everyone knows the story at this point, but just for the listeners who don't know, mm -hmm. um, and he actually said that he wouldn't give up the, the presidential palace unless he was get, allowed to go on TV and explain why he did it. And he made this very compelling speech to Venezuelans and I, he be, became enormously popular for what he said during that, during that. And people should go back and listen to that. It's probably on YouTube or somewhere. Um, what, what, was, what was the famous what was the famous final line where he basically said we have uh, we haven't succeeded yet or something along those lines? Yeah, it was very much like kind of a Fidel Castro's "History Will Absolve Me" style yeah. mm -hmm. uh, little speech, without the length, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know how Castro could talk for so long. Like we've been, I mean, we're having a great discussion. I love this. I'm, I'm having to constantly drink water. You know, like I don't know how he wasn't dying. How Fidel Castro had those like five-hour-long speeches. Very unique ability that served him well, but maybe <laughs> definitely made for some very long days and very long speeches and rallies. Yeah, shout out to Castro. Um, yeah, and then, uh, and then uh, between uh, 1992 and 1998, there's this period in which uh, people, the a lot of Venezuelans start fighting for Hugo Chavez's uh, release from prison. Obviously. He's in prison for attending a coup d'etat. That's what happens when you attempt a coup and you fail. You go to prison in any state, in any society. It's what happens normally. Um, and of course, he gets let out. Um, he, he gets released uh, by, by a presidential pardon. And in 1998, he runs on a platform that uh, calls. It's not, not very radical either. It seems kind of like a, at best, like almost like a Bernie Sanders style platform. It's very like kind of mellow and vanilla like he wants to change the constitution which would be like huge here if we say we want to change the constitution then yeah. like, of course we would you know the suburbs would burn but sorry i don't know why i made that joke commit uh, to it i was that shuttly to myself and i was just sort of like a little bit too wild-eyed and, and nodding enthusiastically when you said the suburbs will burn <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, he, he runs on that platform of changing the constitution. And of course, um, he gets elected and he does end up changing the constitution via popular referendums. Um, it's not like it's like backroom deals in which people are just like writing the constitution in secret. It's actually a very popular uh, process, something similar to what we've been seeing in Chile for the past nine months now. It seems like that, maybe 10 months since like the popular uprising in Chile mm -hmm. um, against the neoliberalism and like the corrupt right wing government there in which they're calling for a new constitution. That's that's the background of that. And Hugo Chavez ends up getting very radicalized because of the attacks he receives, essentially, by the opposition. The opposition does most of the work for, I think, the left in Venezuela more than they would like to admit. Mm -hmm. But they ended up uh, pushing into being what became 21st century socialism, really from the ground up. I mean, this is not like a, a state-led project. I think a lot of people view, uh, certainly who aren't leftists, um, but would certainly view what's happening in Venezuela as a completely state-led project of socialism, yeah. where it actually it's very much a bottom-up. A process in which people are like it's been almost spontaneous in some cases in which people have been organizing and building uh, what became later kind of like the small communes across Venezuela and the kind of uh, cooperative councils. It's one recent thing that just got published. Esther Jackman put this out earlier this week is that there was a uh, some FOIA requests about AFL CIO documents about their involvements in Venezuela and just to see the sort of uh, the violent backlash, which has, you know, been there, whether it was the attempted coup against Chavez in 2002, which there's a great documentary about that I'm going to post in the show notes. But basically, those documents show that that AFL-CIO were working to subvert worker cooperative control of workplaces like they were doing, they were actually undermining the very democratic attempts to like collectivize the workplace. And like all this stuff is now like just sort of like brought out in these documents. Jackman just put out an article. It's actually one of the better things I've read from Jacobin lately. So I'll, I'll post a link for that. It's rare when we see good things from Jacobin these days. So I'm yeah. glad they did that. that yeah, me that too. Yeah, I was actually, I was very pleasantly surprised. I was like, wow, this is actually a really good piece in it. And it's very important to talk about the the deep threat and, and the sort of the ongoing attempts of the US state and the international interests of like banking and finance to, to basically subvert it by any means necessary. I think I've seen jokes, people saying the AFL-CIA and things like that, <laughs> um, which is very uh, timely. You know, I'm looking on pages 128 and 129 and I just caught a couple of really quick quotes just to talk about the the role of dialectic in this chapter he says more than simply a combative identity moreover popular identity is the combative identity of choice across much of Latin America in part due to the quote unquote historical structure heterogeneity that colonialism imposed on the region in which a complex constellation of class relations and other exclusions coexist begging the question of how to bring these together and struggle. The thing that jumped out at me is he mentions uh, Dussel and whenever he published the 20 Theses on Politics, but this is actually a, a comment GCM makes about Dussel, and this is actually, again, a very strangely coincidental, like shared almost understanding that we see in a lot of the most radical approaches to psychoanalysis that we've discussed, like by Alenka Zupancic. So this is uh, GCM. He says, in this concise handbook for engaged political theory and praxis, Dussel argues that the people, or pueblo, represents not unity, but instead the very embodiment of rupture. So we have not approached it from this angle, but this idea that the revolutionary subject is the place of rupture in the social order is uh, again, something that Dussel himself and GCM is talking about. And so, again, I think it's just a really interesting connection to make because we've talked about it just using different language. Yeah. Um, and I mean, we're watching this happen right now. I think we're I think it's very clear in the past few months who the revolutionary subject in the U.S. is right now. The category of the people is obviously very different in each Latin American country, but there is like some a lot of commonalities uh, between something even like Venezuela and a place like Argentina, mm -hmm. where Peronism is obviously the first thing I think of, where um, the concept of the people is brought up in response to, I mean, even to like the Communist Party of Argentina, which during the 1950s is very critical of something that's like, of course, nationalist because they just experienced World War II. Yeah. Um, but also because they're very critical of any project that centers the people and not the working class. So mm -hmm. there's actually some, like, I know that like um, the, the scholar Ernesto Laclo whose book, I think it's called Politics and Ideology and Marxist Theory by Ernesto Laclo, where he centers this question of like Peronism and the people as something that like Marxists should be able to like kind of like conceptualize and use strategically. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's already kind of happening in Venezuela. And it becomes the like embodiment of rupture as Dussel is talking about in that, in that book yeah. as well. GCM uses this for decolonizing dialectic. So this is Dussel again. Um, he says, this is actually him sort of... Uh, taking some shots at Hart and Negri, which I'm not going to read because I just don't care enough to, to actually talk about what they were saying. But he says, instead, the people, like Sorel's reinvigorated class opposition, 
marks a rupture internal to the prevailing totality in which this is Dussel. Quote, the Pueblo establishes an internal frontier or fracture within the political community, staying as it does in opposition to the elites, to the oligarchs, to the ruling classes of the political order. The people is not unity, but division. This is actually almost exactly what we've been talking about with Jody Dean, too. I think whenever she thinks about the communist horizon, I think she's struggling to like get to this sort of realization. I think she is attempting to describe it that the we, the people, is division. And I think that's actually something that's really like it's a really important theoretical point, but it's also really hard to grasp how this positive entity that you're trying to describe is in itself defined by negativity and division and rupture. Yeah, it is. And I mean, if it wouldn't be a revolutionary subject without those things. And I'm I'm glad that he puts it this way that that it that it establishes an internal tier of fracture within the political community in order to like divide classes. It's not so much a it's not unity but division. I mean that's exactly how we want I think want to like discuss strategy, especially when we discuss where we organize, how we organize, especially in the U.S. Um, I think this is a good like, like starting point to think through where we want to be and what neighborhoods we want to organize in, yeah. what workplaces. This is yeah. very key stuff. Yeah, and also like that rupture doesn't just create the pueblo, it also creates the them, you know? It's like, oh, who are we against? Yeah. It's going to be everyone who is on the other side of the rupture point. That's right. And I think this is like why uh, something like dialectics is so, is so useful. This is a kind of overall point, but like why decolonizing dialectics, but dialectics generally is useful as a poli- for political theory and not just for philosophy and caging it within philosophy and just leaving it there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. This is actually made it like, far more useful and productive for, for the uh, millennials and, gen- and gen- gen Zers, apparently. But um, yeah. It's it's good for that. Millennial Gen Z unity in, in decolonized dialectics. That's what we're about. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yes. But then how we apply that pessimistic, that dialectical pessimism is important. We'll figure that out in those moments. We're, we're working um, on that. Yeah. yeah. I don't have a whole lot else on this chapter regarding uh, Venezuela. I mean, there's certain things that he points out that I think are really interesting regarding like the Venezuelan folk singer Ali Primera mm-hmm. um, and his rendition of Gloria al Bravo Pueblo, which is uh, Glory to the Brave P- People, which is like, I think it's the national anthem of Venezuela, if I remember correctly. Then he has a kind of a, a, a reading of, and there's a few other things in here that are really interesting regarding um the chavistas and like the kind of like question of identity of course of like being bolivarians or being chavistas yeah. or being socialist being like having these big particular markers and signs and signifiers but obviously i want to get to like that joke he makes at the very end of the chapter no let's do it because yeah i i have like sort of a couple of pages where i didn't mark anything and then i came to that and i literally like was bracketing and and starring things so let's do it i think this joke is amazing it's also kind of a very zizekian thing to do is to explicate yeah. a really complex ontological like theoretical insight through the structure of a joke so to me this is like like i've read so much zizek this feels like very like it just feels very familiar it's like oh yeah the final point that's really going to suture everything together is going to be a really great joke <laughs> I, the gcm is far more zizeki and i think you want to admit um that's probably true yeah <laughs> okay so I, i'll just quote that uh that last paragraph then in his uh, Golpe de Timon speech, just delivered just before his death, Chavez recounted a well-known joke about an indigenous community and a Catholic priest. It was Holy Week, and the priest, seeing a fattened pig nearby, reminded the community that they were not allowed to eat pork that week. Only fish, or the large amphibi- amphibious rodent known as the jigiri, or the capybara. The priest then took several community members to the river to be baptized with Christian names. When the priest returned later that day to find the community dancing and roasting the recently slaughtered pig, he was appalled. The response, which Chavez playfully recounted to highlight the danger of merely calling things socialist while capitalism remains intact, stands also as a testament to both subaltern cunning and a subversively decolonial dialectic. Quote, no, we solved the problem. We baptized this pig and named it Chigiri, the the capybara. (laughs) I love it. And and for more reference, I guess, for, for those listening, uh, the Gope de Timon speech is actually very key. Monthly Review has, and I'll, I'll send you the link for it, actually has a transcription of it in English. Oh, that would be uh, awesome. Because even they know how key that, that speech is for like understanding the role of this of the whole communal uh, Bolivarian project mm-hmm. in Venezuela. Yeah, let's definitely link that. That would be awesome for people to go read that. And then I have stuff in the in the conclusion, but I actually have like kind of like larger questions. 
Yeah, I do have a few. Well, I guess I already hit on my larger questions. Like, I was wondering. This. Like, yeah, I was wondering if we kind of like we're picking those up as we are going through. Okay, actually, we can do something right quick. Okay, so do you accept this definition of like dialectics, the dynamic movement of conflictive oppositions? Is this something that seems one politically useful, and, and two, is it dialectic? Good question. I I mean, I would say yes to both. This is one of the things that like kind of struck me as bizarre whenever I I listened to an interview with McGowan and he said, "Well, I'm not a Marxist because." I don't see dialectics as this like closed stasis, kind of the frozen dialectic that Georges Sorel was kind of critiquing. And, you know, my thing was sort of like, did we read the same stuff? Because my read of Marx, is, is, you know, and, and it isn't like exhaustive, but, you know, I've been reading Marx as much as I can thoroughly for a long time. I just never understood that interpretation of Marx. That always struck me as like a, a like an afterward appropriation by things like the Second International and shit like that. So I think that the reason why it's still politically useful, if you define it in that way, is precisely the way that we think about dialectical pessimism. It's like the whole point is that contradictions will never cease. And that's a that's an important, worthwhile and desirable thing. And also, I think what I love about it is that it does help you create divisions in a social order, especially now. I mean, again, with the rebellions, you know, it's like history is like back on the table. The future may not be canceled. We don't know yet. Um, <laughs> But what it does is it shows you that, you know, there are these long periods where it does feel like the engine of history has stopped, you know, things are in stasis. And I do think that this kind of dialectics is, has a way of revealing that there is always a negativity and a rupture, even if it doesn't appear that way. And also, I think it's, it's a really promising approach to dialectics, which also, like, kind of in the way that Dussel was using it, like, can actually help you start to understand the connection between, let's say, revolutionary Marxism and things like Afro-pessimism, things like decolonial perspectives, this idea of, like, the subaltern, right, which is, like, one of the post-colonial sort of concepts par excellence. So for me, I think dialectics defined in this way, not only is like politically useful to understand and to like organize with as this is like a fundamental approach, but I also think it opens it up to finding connections or like sympathetic kinds of understandings of like what it is to, to bring about a revolutionary social change in society in a way that I think to me has been really useful. I mean, in some ways it's like, you know, I read a lot of that decolonial, like post-colonial sorts of perspectives. I was very grounded in that before I got like back into Marxism. And this to me is kind of a, you know, weirdly, I'm going to do my little dialectic fingers, like a weird dialectical synthesis, because now for me, they come back together. They are in tension, but it's a really productive tension. So I don't know. I'm, I'm curious for you, though, considering this is like the book that you picked is like what, how you would answer those questions. Yeah, uh... I, I totally accept this definition of dialectics because I think it's I think it's something that we can use. It's something in the theoretical toolbox at the very least that mm -hmm. you can pull out from specific political moments. But I think it's like proven itself to be like, like the the definition of maybe not. That's a very big thing to say. He never says the dialectics at any point in this yeah. book, which is probably like or the dialectic. He's not that bold. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I think it's the most politically useful understanding of dialectics uh, for our political struggles today and has proven its, I think it's kind of proven its salt in this book in, yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. So I'm really on board with it. That's a very short answer. Yeah. But, I, yeah. Well, I mean, my answers are overly long and complicated, so that's probably a good thing. But I will, I will tell you, like, the thing that I really come away with is that I, even if you could quibble about like the rigor or the structure of his definition and whether it really matches up to Marx or, you know, it's like, I don't really give a shit. Like, this is how I like to think about dialectics and how it feels most relevant and applicable to me. And I will tell you that, and I'll, I've said this in a discussion we've had before so with some like our Red Library associated sorts of like critical debates we've had. Essentially, any dialectics that doesn't also help me like connect and, and understand the history of colonialism and like the African continent and in Latin America, it's like, if it doesn't help me think about that, I don't fucking want to have anything to do with it personally. So what I like about this is it helps me bring together, you know, the tradition that I feel I'm a part of, which is, you know, a revolutionary Marxist tradition with these other internationalist anti-imperialist moments, which to me are, they have to be foundational. So I really love it because it's like a theoretical basis for that. Same. I'm um, really on board with it. I really don't have anything else. We already hit on these questions. I was going to ask questions like, uh, is this dialectical? Da, 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 da. I already talked about Dussel, teleology. Yeah. I mean, this is I, obviously the, the question of, is there a colonized dialectics? Yeah. I mean, of course there is. 
But I think Fanon makes it very clear that it's like a stasis. It doesn't move. Everything is frozen. So there is clearly like a reverse. There is like an antithesis to it mm -hmm. that does exist. Um, apartheid and Jim Crow are obvious examples of this. Yeah. So I have a question. I mean, for you I have comment. Never... So you kind of mentioned this at a few points. What would you say your biggest criticisms of this book were? I would have wanted him to say something new about Fanon, maybe something if he had like, yeah, yeah, really bad. If he had said something new about Fanon, because he spends two chapters on Fanon. So it's yeah. like 40, 50 easy pages maybe i mean it's like a fourth of the book i mean those two chapters are like a significant chunk of it yeah that's my only serious critique of it but i, I think that's uh that that's okay if, if he's gonna have if he's gonna keep it in there and it just reinforces what he's saying mm -hmm. all right okay i just wish he had gone to more detail with it or, or like given us something like new with it and been yeah. more, maybe a, a bit more creative it's hard to ask him to be more creative i guess maybe i'm asking for the world but yeah it's just to read him against himself, you know, one of the things that stood out to me was where he quotes Simon Rodriguez, who is, you know, Simon Bolivar's like teacher. And he has this great yeah. quote where he says, invitamos o eramos. So like either we invent or we err. And so part of me is like, come on, GCM, like you should have invented in those chapters and maybe you erred a little bit. And, and that's okay. I mean, it's a, I still love the book. Yeah, same. Um, I mean, the fact that he's able to use Sorel and Ducel and Fanon together and along with accompanying him with CLR James and Amy Cicer and like, I mean, at different points, I, I didn't point, talk about him too much, but Du Bois does show up now yeah. and then with like mm -hmm. some, some black reconstruction and stuff like that. But yeah, uh, that's that's my same critique. I will tell you, there was one yeah. thing that stood out to me. I'm not even really sure like it's worth critiquing, but it was one of those things where it just struck me as like, it's one of these academic philosophical things that sometimes I think are really useful, but also times, sometimes it's like, you're just using buzzwords and I have no idea what you mean by this. <laughs> There's a couple of times where he uses the word micro dialectics, and I literally was like, "What the fuck does that mean? I have no idea what a micro dialectics <laughs> is." And I just was, I just sort of like laughed and just put big question marks, and I was like, "Yeah, I'll just move on." But I mean, some of that to me was like, I, I love how rigorous it is, and it's obviously like a PhD thesis. But whenever someone says micro dialectics and doesn't really bother to say much about it, it kind of like makes my eyes roll a little bit. Yeah, I, it makes me think of like a socialist party with a Fight Club, you know, as like as like a <laughs> Sort of thing that happens you know it's just like oh it's a micro dialectic the things are happening you know but and maybe some politics will change people will feel different about each other afterwards hopefully they hug it out but yeah and like literally like fight club like the movie people fighting under in like a basement of a bar and with like, with like a hammer and sickle in the background sort of thing uh, uh, maybe we'll we'll start a we'll start our own little micro dialectic chapter here in texas for anyone that wants to come join i'm down i'm down no punching the face you know yeah, well, no, no face punching. That's that'll be our one rule. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> uh, other than that, you just exert massive violence on each other. <laughs> so, exactly. Comrade Brandt, fellow Red Army faction member, I have to tell you again, I this was has been a phenomenal episode. Um, so I have a couple of questions for you just to wrap up as we get out of here. One, would you ever want to come back and do another episode? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, I want you yeah, to start. Yeah, I, I had no problem. It's actually a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, well, good. I'm glad you enjoyed and thought it was a good time. <laughs> considering you just yeah. committed two hours of your life to it. I, I think tackling more things in this than this vein, and it, from what I've gathered in the bit that we've talked, it seems like you have a really strong passion for politics in like Central and South America and revolutionary politics. And, and you know, we have a whole series on this exact topic. So maybe you and I can discuss a, another book to do that might be in that vein at some point. I'd be down for that. Absolutely. And I guess the last thing I was going to mention is, um, do you want to like plug anything one last time? Do you want to mention Houston Review of Books, any particular, what book reviews are you working on? I know you're always like putting stuff out as well. I haven't been doing any book reviews. I've been, uh, I took a Spanish class uh, for a month and a half this summer and awesome. that like completely ate yeah. up all my reading mm. and then i focused on like uh doing this episode and then doing the uh the round table discussion episode so like i haven't had time to do any kind of like personal book review writing yeah. or anything i guess my next project i'm going to work on is i wanted to like do kind of an analysis of like architecture in houston and infrastructure and uh city planning and urban planning um around what we would like to see as like a future Houston, a post-capitalist Houston, you know, hopefully not like a fascist Houston if it's post-capitalist, but you know, like something that's like, you know, hopefully not too dystopian, but in the vein, I was of like people like, okay, so I shouldn't follow this guy on Twitter, but it, the guy's name is at Wrath of Non, and uh -huh. he's like this architecture traditionalist guy, but he makes these really, like he's very much a reactionary, but he makes these great points about like architecture and about how like how cities should be built and like how it's just, like I can't help but follow him and like read Lewis <laughs> 
shit like that. So it's kind of like, I might write something about that. That's my next project. No book reviews on the horizon right now, but hopefully I can do some uh, on the road. Where yeah. uh, how many people could we say we should start any discussion of them with? You know, I probably shouldn't follow this person on Twitter, but here it goes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I will tell you, we got some we got some very interested architecture stands. You know, radical urban planning, city planning stands. So maybe uh, we could do some stuff around that at some point. I think that'd be super cool. We've talked about actually doing more stuff around like urban spaces and such, and and socialist and and communist critique. So that could be good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think there's a lot to gain out of that, especially when it comes to like the history of like Soviet city planning and socialist city planning. Yeah. Um, I think that that's a very lost horizon. Like the question of like what we want our cities to look like and our towns to look like and to absolutely. be and to fit in with our natural ecosystem and it makes and make it food food and food sustainable and you know that we're not like killing our planet or dying in Houston of hurricanes and flooding which is something we deal with every other year, I think. Yep. And I think we're on point. I'm going to curse myself, knock on wood, uh, that we're not going to get another hurricane in the next two months, but we might. Like, it's always on the horizon. Well, you know, speaking of sort of the impacts of climate change and it's, uh, you know, how fucking real it's getting, you know, we had a, there was a hurricane, what? It was a tropical storm and upgraded to a Category 1 hurricane, what, two weeks ago? So it's just an ever-present yeah. threat on the horizon, especially, yeah, in Houston around the around the Gulf and, like, Galveston and Brownsville and such. Yeah, I, I got nothing else to plug. I mean, hopefully that people will check out Houston Review Books at the beginning of it and that'll yeah. be enough for them. But even if not, I could, the episode was more important to me and I, I loved this. This was a lot of fun and I like talking to you about this kind of stuff. So you know, I'd be definitely a Central American, South American series. Yeah, well, we're, we're, I'm sure we're going to have no trouble finding some good shit to do. So, well, Comrade Brandt, fellow Red Army Faction member, fellow Ginger Telepathic Brethren, it's been real. <laughs> it's been real, man. The human condition, plans for mankind, and collaboration between people in those tasks which increase the sum total of humanity are new problems which demand true inventions. Let us decide not to imitate Europe. Let us combine our muscles and our brains in a new direction. Let us try to create the whole human being whom Europe has been incapable of bringing to triumphant birth. Two centuries ago, a former European colony decided to catch up with Europe. It succeeded so well that the United States of America became a monster in which the taints, the sickness, and the inhumanity of Europe have grown to appalling dimensions. The West saw itself as a spiritual adventure. It is the name of the spirit, in the name of the spirit of Europe, that the West has made her encroachments, that she has justified her crimes and legitimized the slavery in which she holds four-fifths of humanity. Yes, the European spirit has strange roots. So, comrades, let us not pay tribute to Europe by creating states, institutions, and societies which draw their inspiration from her. Humanity is waiting for something other from us. If we want to turn Africa into a new Europe, then let us leave the destiny of our countries to Europeans. They will know how to do it better than the most gifted among us. But if we want humanity to advance a step further, if we want to bring it up to a different level, then that which Europe has shown, then we must invent and we must make discoveries for Europe, for ourselves, and for humanity. Comrades, we must turn over a new leaf. We must work out new concepts and try to set afoot a new human being. You know, we are not afraid of a little controversy on Red Library. We're not afraid of putting out that icy cold analysis against the grain, against the general hegemonic consensus. I bet you didn't expect we were going to try to recuperate for the left, for the dialectical pessimist left, Georgia Sorrell, but it just happened. You just heard it. We're trying to fight for the future and simultaneously recuperate the past in new ways, finding those lost horizons that have been lost throughout the last century. Big heart energy, big dialectical energy to comrade slash patron Brant for picking an amazing book, for doing an amazing job leading this episode. I cannot wait to have him back on. And really, again, go over, check out Houston Review of Books, read the book reviews, the essays, the poetry, all the amazing content that they are putting out. They deserve all of your attention, all of your big heart energy. Support their work because we do here at the show. 
Until we see you back here next time, remember your comrades all across the Lost Horizons network, we out here putting in the work day in and day out. Theorizing, analyzing, podcasting, organizing, shit posting, shit talking, trying to be ice cold motherfuckers. The only way out is through, comrades. That's the DP way. Take care of yourselves, mask up, and mask off when appropriate, and we'll see you back here next time. Red Library out.